Good afternoon. Welcome to our new meeting in a webinar session and a virtual meeting of the sixth Michael J. Marburger meeting that we have every year. This meeting is specially dedicated to frontiers in neurology, new challenges, new areas, areas where we have made a lot of progress and areas we're looking forward to in the next year, 2021. Unfortunately, due to the events worldwide, this meeting is not in live, in person, but it's virtually, and maybe through this method will reach a wider audience and will uh, attract different people from areas that we would otherwise not have been reaching. Uh, thank you for spending this afternoon with us. Uh, you will be excited about a top program of top speakers, international speakers and local speakers who will address the key issues in the diseases we face in our daily practice. Uh, we're doing this meeting in cooperation with certain agencies and uh, certain uh, partners that have been our loyal partners over the years. And I want to thank them at the beginning, certainly the Arbeitskreis der Uro-Onkologie from the Austrian Association of Urology, uh, led by Kilian Gust, who's going to be a speaker at our event, the Karl Landsteiner Institute, and obviously the Comprehensive Cancer Center, which is uh, the center that drives oncologic care, oncologic research, and oncologic education at the Medical University of Vienna and the General Hospital. We also work with two other a working groups of the Austrian Association of Urology, that is the imaging working group on Karl Seitz, Christian Seitz, who will talk at the end also on stone management and laparoscopy, which is run by uh, Mesut Ramsey. I certainly want to thank the sponsors who have made uh, tremendous contributions over the years and have been even now in these difficult circumstances uh, um, supporting us uh, to be able to deliver to you the knowledge and the uh, education content that you need to become better at what you do. And uh, that is Jensen as our gold partner. And there's also a Jensen dedicated uh, talk uh, um, that has been uh, given uh, the Jensen lecture. Uh, you will see it, it's on ureteal carcinoma in advanced stages. And the other partners you know very well. I want to uh, specifically name Astellas, AstraZeneca and Takeda who've been uh, their uh, silver partners. I want to also introduce to you two of the most incredible ladies in uh, urology family, if you want. They're not urologists per se, but uh, they have uh, contributed to the urologic uh, patient care, uh, science and uh, medicine in a wide area. And why uh, beyond that, there are tremendous people who are uh, people that I admire and look up to and have been very special uh, chance to spend this afternoon with them. Uh, locked in here for a few hours and uh, we can pick the brain, you can send questions in. But uh, very importantly, um, they also have become part uh, either of the Medical University of Vienna family, but also of the Department of Urology over the last year. The biggest contribution and milestone, uh, I think, for our specific department in Vienna. Uh, Manuela Schmiedinger, everybody in the world knows, she specializes in internal medicine, medical oncology and intensive care, a broad area of expertise. Uh, she's been focusing over the last 20 years on renal cell carcinoma and I don't know anybody in the world has more uh, uh, knowledge, experience and uh, passion for a field as, as uh, Manuela does. Um, I can, uh, she's a tremendous physician uh, and a tremendous partner in a division uh, um, uh, with us. She joined our department in November. Uh, I, I would say this is certainly the best hire and the best decision I've made in my life uh, of all the decisions in my academic career uh, to somehow make it attractive to her to join us. This uh, is leading to um, incredible uh, synergies in the uh, care delivery in clinical trials and so on. Uh, she's part of the ESMO guidelines and many activities at the ESMO, uh, which is the leading society for oncological care with the EAU uh, in Europe. Um, the second speaker I want to introduce to you is uh, Professor Eva Compera. Uh, everybody in neurology knows Eva as well. She's uh, certainly the best uh, europathologist there is in Europe and beyond. She's unique. She's uh, been dedicated to, she's an Austrian that lived in France but now is partly back in Austria. Uh, she's dedicated her life to Europathology, is part of every single guideline, a loved and cherished member of the guidelines, as, uh, as similar to Manuela, published a tremendous amount of papers, worldwide recognized, not only through her research and educational activities, but her clinical care, second opinions on slides, 
uh, that she gets from everywhere in the world. Uh, she's uh, um, uh, head uh, of pathology in France at the Sorbonne University, you know, the most uh, powerful and renowned uh, university, and has also an appointment now in Vienna uh, um, since uh, September 2020 in the, the pathology department, and has already changed completely the way we deliver the care to our urologic oncologic patients. She will be with us this afternoon as well. The guest speakers, you will recognize some of the photos, uh, some better looking, some less good looking guys, um, just joking obviously, and uh, they will be talking about certain areas that will be of highly interest to you and the program, uh, hopefully you can see it online. Um, I will cover a broad area. We will have three major sessions. The first session being certainly on prostate and prostate cancer specifically, uh, starting from imaging, uh, care delivery, and uh, the innovations and revolutions that have happened through the meetings in advanced and metastatic care. Um, some uh, lectures will be pre-recorded and some lectures will be live and so you can have uh, live interaction with our speakers. The second session is on bladder and uh, uh, kidney cancer um, and here you, you will have our two uh, co-moderators uh, specifically talking and uh, um, um, several other experts looking at the metastatic care, how we can improve there and certainly on what is happening new on uh, in biomarkers and uh, variant histologies and so on. And we will finish with the metastatic care as well here in ureteric carcinoma. And the last uh, part uh, is a change in a program that I'm very excited and actually tweeted it a few moments ago. Um, 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 we will talk on general care in neurology, uh, uh, prehabilitations and so on, how uh, rehabilitation in a patient, how what can we do better in the cancer delivery beyond only the cancer targeting, uh, but also looking at the patient in as wholesome. Um, and then we will talk briefly about stones because this is an important area of urology. But we will finish on a talk that was um, from the foremost um, uh, infec infection specialist in Austria, uh, Florian Talhammer, uh, who is a really uh, a man without equal. Uh, and I, uh, just two hours ago, because he's also the corona expert of the country and of our hospital and the university and the hospital system of Vienna, I asked him, why don't you give a talk on corona? He said, I've never been asked to give a talk so late uh, before my official talk, but I will do my best and he will give us a talk on management of the uh, corona afflicted patient, uh, the symptomatic patient, and that is, I think, a, a great uh, novelty to us because we have heard about the vaccines, we have heard about diagnosis, but what happens really to the patient once he's on the floor? What can we do for him? What treatment methodologies do we have to improve his care, shorten his disease, and get him out back to activity and normal life again? So he will give that will be the final talk. And at all at the end, we do our usual ceremony of the awards. Our department uh, gives awards for different performances uh, in our department and partners in the year. Uh, the only award we will not give this year is a Lifetime Achievement Award because we want to give that next year uh, when that uh, specific person who has been selected will be with us in person. But we have a few awards that we will declare and I think uh, all our residents and faculty are excited to see who's going to be the one most cherished for education, for science and so on in our department through their contribution. Once again, I want to thank you for your time, for your interest and for sticking with us for the next uh, five hours. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. You will have a fantastic series of lectures, questions, interactions. By the way, you can send your question directly through that internet site to the email address and we will ask the speaker for you. Uh, it will be uh, uh, an email that is online so uh, uh, where you can see it. Thank you very much for being with us and enjoy the day and the afternoon. Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, uh, welcome to this uh, video session uh, organized by Professor Shariat. Thanks very much for this kind invitation and for organizing again also with this difficult period uh, a new edition of the MGM. That's the tool I have been uh, using the last years uh, in order to perform uh, bipolar enucleation and uh, in the next uh, minutes you, s you will see some points of the technique before going into details uh, of uh, the discussion 
And uh, that's uh, some tips and tricks. Here you see the vermontanum, the lateral lobes, and I always start my um, enucleation by doing this omega type incision uh, proximal to the vero. You see, due to this particular loop, uh, um, that uh, the coagulation properties uh, uh, are very uh, high in quality, and this loop is inside a conventional resectoscope. So you are working with a conventional resectoscope, and this makes uh, obviously lear the learning curve uh, uh, rather short. Uh, you see, it's a conventional movement back and forwards of the loop in order to find, to define the level of the layer of the capsule which is rather easy to find because you just push back and forwards. Then obviously you have to decide as soon as you have done the first incision whether you are going to do a two, a three or, or uh, an unblock resection of the adenoma. In, uh, depending probably on the type of uh, the anatomy uh, you are uh, facing, you're going uh, to decide uh, which strategy you're going to adopt. Uh, the more experienced you are, probably the less incision you're going to do. But if you have to start with a three-lobe technique, which is probably the best uh, thing to start with in your uh, um, experience, then uh, you see how well this instrument performs because it gives you the possibility to vapor resect and to incise very broad channels. I generally start at 5 and 7 o'clock from the blood and egg to the omega incision. The next step shows you how I am uh, doing the mobilization of uh, the apex of the prostate. Never looking at the sphincter, I just follow in the plane of the capsule the curvature, the convexity of the apex. And I just turn uh, around the apex until I reach uh, the 12 o'clock position, just by doing this mainly blunt dissection as I was mentioning before, just by moving back and forward the loop. You see, it's a just back and forward movement, so you can uh, very easily identify the layer, just as uh, you were used probably to do when performing adenomectomies. So it's more or less the same uh, principle, and uh, you see, the layer of the capsule very clearly, whitish. As soon as you have finished the mobilization until the 12 o'clock, uh, you generally need to divide the lobes, uh, doing a midline incision also in the 12 o'clock, if you do a two or three lobe technique. Then you have to detach the adenoma from the attachment of the sphinct. And here you see this strip of mucosa, which holds uh, the adenoma itself at its apex. And you have to respect the sphincter, which is up there, just leaving a strip of approximately 5 to 10 millimeters. So don't go too close up to the sphincter respect this uh, uh, 5 to 10 millimeters in order, in order not to injure the sphincter itself. So this is uh, the, trip, the trick in order not to uh, damage the sphincter. And then you conclude the detachment of the mucosa. I generally leave uh, the lobe attached uh, at the lateral part of the blood and neck, uh, and uh, here you see the advantage of this particular loop that you have the possibility not only to do a frontal movement like this, but you can even amputate the lobe hanging at the blood and neck by doing this uh, uh, um, curvature movement along the blood and neck. So if you then have remnants, like in this case, you vaporisect them. 
So this goes very straightforward until you are finished and the lobe drops down into the bladder. Then you will face the last part of the procedure, which is morselation. For morselation, you need to have a clear view. That's why take your time to coagulate very well. This is probably the most important aspect of the procedure. I prefer to leave the lobe hanging in the middle of the bladder. Um, in order to do an enucleation, or why do we do an enucleation? We want to do an enucleation if we need, if you want to remove much tissue. And if uh, you want to remove tissue, you need to do an enucleation because it produces the highest drop of PSA. Um, looking in particular at um, the technique of bipolar enucleation, there is already enough evidence, already enough literature. There are already five randomized clinical trials and there is already a meta-analysis recently published in the World Journal uh, last year. Um, and in those 2,300 patients, um, you, uh, you equally distribute it. Uh, if we look mainly at the prospective trials, which, is, uh, uh, which are uh, uh, on the right side of this uh, crowded slide, you will see that the functional results all are in favor of uh, the bipolar enucleation. And looking at this forest plot, always looking at the right side, also complications are in favor of uh, bipolar enucleation over compared to bipolar TERP. Clearly, this is uh, a big advantage. And although bipolar enucleation of the prostate had already demonstrated um, to be efficient, efficient uh, towards HOLEP already back 2006, um, it took other two meta-analyses almost 10 years later uh, to make uh, enucleation of the prostate be accepted uh, as uh, a valuable technique. And uh, in order to uh, allow this uh, system of enucleation of the prostate to be accepted in uh, the guidelines, in the EAU guidelines, um, 2016. So it took obviously some years uh, to accept beyond uh, HOLEP uh, bipolar enucleation as a very important tool to be efficient in uh, remove tissue uh, in very large prostates. So we have two minimal invasive options, HOLEP and bipolar enucleation if we want to go for uh, a, a minimal invasive approach uh, and anatomic endoscopic enucleation. Now the, the argument uh, is no longer which uh, energy source is better. Now literature is more oriented in looking how can we achieve a shorter learning curve, how can we prevent incontinence, how can we reduce retrograde ejaculation. And dear colleagues and friends, uh, hoping that pandemics, uh, these pandemics is uh, 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 soon uh, be uh, belong, belonging to the past, uh, I invite you to join us in uh, Salzburg September 21 uh, for uh, a Congress uh, monothematic on enucleation of the prostate. Stay safe uh, and bye-bye. Uh, from Salzburg. Thank you very much, Professor Uzuardo, for this very nice uh, presentation. I would just like to make a comment from a pathology point of view, because when we get the resection specimen, it's very, well, not very often, but 10% of patients have 
prostate cancer in there and most of the time it's unexpected. And so we do not have a real handling, kind of uh, general international handling, what to do with these kind of, of samples afterwards, how to report them. We do not know whether we should really include the whole sample afterwards because if you have a very huge resection, you do not take the whole tissue. Um, so I think th this could be something which could really be interesting in the upcoming years to do some kind of international guidelines, what to do with these kind of samples. Thank you. Yeah, I absolutely agree, uh, Eva. This is a great point and we see that uh, quite often as we are performing these uh, therapeutic interventions for BPH, uh, for symptomatic BPH at a time point where the patients are also older and, and there could be some unrecognized, sometimes uh, 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 in unimportant or non-dangerous, if you want, prostate cancer and some of them could have some clinical relevance and how we can not only report it but how that's going to change our management with the new treatment avenues we have in the aging population and longer life expectancy. Uh, altogether, I think uh, we have seen over the last uh, 30 years a number of instrumental therapies that have changed our management of BPH. Uh, we started with microwave, radio frequency, and so on. And today we have certainly a, a, a repertoire of uh, instruments that is quite impressive. And uh, the future certainly lies in defining which therapeutic modality is ideal in which patient, and with a shared decision making with the patient, finding the top. Uh, um, uh, modality as uh, Lucas put to you um, that could benefit that individual patient. For example, retrograde ejaculation may be important for some of the patients and other patients other issues and shapes of the prostate and so on. So we are looking forward to the uh, novelties in these areas. Uh, we we uh, at our department have uh, four therapeutic uh, tools that we use for BPH management for surgical interventions and choose according to the patient whether it's on anticoagulation and so on. Uh, I want to introduce the next speaker, uh, Ganesh Palapatu. Ganesh Palapatu has been uh, associate, an adjunct professor of our department since the inception of our department. He's been a close friend for over 20 years. Uh, he's one of the most amazing person I've met at all the levels. Uh, he's a researcher uh, uh, without equal, but he's a leader uh, foremost uh, who has shaped uh, urology in the United States and now is the chairman at Michigan, which has the biggest department of uro-oncology in uh, any urology department. Uh, that is uh, uh, quite impressive in the output, specifically in, uh, in two areas, and he will talk about one of those areas, in the areas of public health policies, where there have been number one and questionnaires and uh, health-related questionnaires and so on. But uh, specifically his focus and his lab's focus is on genetics and epigenetics of prostate cancer and how we can use that and, and sort of uh, get some information that could change our management on the, uh, on the everyday uh, practice. So his talk will be on germline genetic testing of prostate cancer, when we need it and so on. I will tell you this is reality already for us at the university. Every almost patient with metastatic disease gets germline testing. Thank you Ganesh. Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Good day everyone. It's a pleasure for me today to participate in the sixth annual Michael J. Marburger Frontiers in Urology meeting, organized by the Medical University of Vienna. Thank you so much, Sherog, for the invitation. I hope you all are doing well, and I look forward to seeing you all in person sometime soon. It's a pleasure for me today to talk to you all about germline genetic testing and prostate cancer. What, why, and how? Recent studies have shown that upwards of one in 10 men with metastatic prostate cancer have germline DNA re repair mutations. Uh, this was really uh, delineated nicely from a New England Journal of Medicine article almost four years ago now by Pritchard et al. that showed that approximately 11% of men with metastatic prostate cancer harbored pathogenic germline mutations. Notably, most of these mutations were involved in DNA mismatch repair. These types of mutations typically are autosomal dominant in type, uh, and notably, not all men in this particular study had a family history of prostate cancer. In fact, this was an unselected group of men with metastatic prostate cancer. So why consider germline genetic testing for men with potentially clinically localized disease? Well, one, there is the issue with regards to risk assessment. In other words, what is the probability of a man having prostate cancer in a man who's yet to be diagnosed with the disease? 
Imagine a patient presenting with a modestly elevated PSA and with yet to have a diagnosis of prostate cancer. And the question is, is should we pursue a, a diagnosis or not? Could this patient harbor a germline genetic alteration that might predispose them to prostate cancer or potentially other cancers that could be harmful to them? The second issue revolves around a disease prevention. In other words, uh, if there is a uh, identifiable germline genetic alteration, the question is, is, is there a possibility for us to modify this risk? Third is prognosis. And of course, the big question here is, do germline alterations have an impact on prognosis? Clearly, there is a, a potential impact here on treatment selection. And we have to keep in mind and ask ourselves whether certain treatments are more or less effective in the setting of very specific mutations. Uh, and finally, there's issues with regards to familial risk and genetic testing. In other words, who needs to be tested in a family and how? Well, I think we, could, we all know that all cancer is genetic, but interestingly, not all cancer is hereditary. There's clearly a difference. Cancers in general are characterized by somatic genetic alterations. These are alterations that occur at the cellular level in the specific cell that, that's altered within a tumor. But not all cancers, of course, are hereditary. Hereditary would mean that there are genetic alterations that are in the germline that are present in all of the cells uh, that for some reason predispose those cells to cancer. Take a look at here at this cartoon graphic, and you can see here a, clusters of, a cluster of cells and that there is, in fact, first a first mutation that, for some reason, alters the growth pattern of this particular cell, and it moves it in towards a cancer phase. Sometimes second mutations can occur, and these are often passenger mutations, those that don't really contribute or drive carcinogenesis, but you have the driver mutation continue, and that this sort of mutation continues and, and gives a, a selective advantage uh, for cancer cells with, within a tumor. But what is the difference I think this, if we don't really think about this a lot, I think the question is, what is the difference between somatic and hereditary genetic alterations? Well, again, germline alterations, as I mentioned earlier, are those alterations that are present in all cells within a given organism. These are cells that are passed on from either, uh, inherited from either mom or dad, and are present, again, within all, all cells of, 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 a, of a patient. Conversely, Somatic mutations are not present in the germline, are not hereditable, but rather occur in isolated areas within a given tissue, like, for example, this pink patch here. And you can imagine if there is a, these are, these are the mutations that occur at a, at a locus, at a particular organ, uh, and predispose that particular organ uh, and those cells within the organ to getting cancer. And I think the clear distinction here is that germline alterations are hereditary. Somatic alterations are not. So what about hereditary, familial, and sporadic prostate cancers? We know that approximately five to 10% of all new diagnoses of prostate cancer are hereditary in nature. That is to say, they're associated with a single inherited genetic mutation, typically in genes such as BRCA1, BRCA2, the mismatch repair genes, Lynn syndrome, and HOXP13. Approximately one-fifth of newly diagnosed prostate cancers are considered familial in nature, meaning there's no clear identifiable or detectable mutation, but there appears to be a, a clear association uh, with familial risk. That is to say, many family members have, uh, have prostate cancer or, or associated cancers within the family. There's a strong sense that uh, the prostate cancer is uh, familial. And of course, as we all know, the, the vast majority of men with newly diagnosed prostate cancer have in fact sporadic disease. So if we were to break down the, uh, the potential genetic causes, a predisposition for prostate cancer. Again, you'll see that the hereditary uh, areas, the hereditary lesions, uh, again, uh, affect many more fewer patients than, the, than it's thought that the familial cases do. Hereditary uh, alterations, particularly in genes, as I mentioned earlier, such as those that impact uh, DNA mismatch repair, and are associated with a significant uh, or moderate effect size, meaning a changes, a genetic changes associated with significant phenotype, uh, comprise about five to 10% of all cases. 20% of the genetic predisposition cases, as again mentioned earlier, are much, much more common uh, and not, no, not associated with any known genetic alterations. These are typically associated with single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, and picked up through various uh, uh, genome-wide association studies or GWAS hits. So what, are, what proportion of patients with localized disease have germline uh, mutations pre predisposing them to cancer. Well, this was addressed in a, I would say, pretty landmark study last year that came out in JAMA Oncology uh, that showed approximately 
of men with clinically localized disease. These are patients without a family history. This is all comers. 17% of patient men with clinically localized prostate cancer harbored a known uh, genetic alteration in a prostate cancer susceptibility gene. Uh, of these, the overall pre prevalence of alterations in BRCA1, BRCA2 is approximately 6% in this population. And uh, within the 17%, only a third uh, or 30% of the alterations were in BRCA1, BRCA2, meaning there are many other genes associated with the development of uh, potential development of prostate cancer in this population. So here's a, a nice graphic describing from the same paper describing some of the common genetic alterations. Again, if you look at all, among all the, all the genetic alterations uh, found in men with clinically localized prostate cancer, BRCA2 is by far the commonest. But then you see genes like CHUK2, ATM, MMR, and the DNA glycosylase, MUTYH, also comprise uh, an aggregate, a fair uh, proportion of, uh, uh, of cases as well. Again, suggesting that BRCA2 is important, but so are other genetic alterations. BRCA1, BRCA2 certainly have importance in prostate cancer, uh, as many of you know, as well as in breast cancer. And it is a, it is a DNA damage response gene. Uh, alterations of BRCA1 uh, and 2, predominantly BRCA2, uh, increase your lifetime risk of prostate cancer anywhere from two to six fold. Uh, and also it, it increases your risk of early prostate cancer, particularly in men who have a BRCA2 alteration by almost ninefold. It's, it's been shown repeatedly that patients with uh, predominantly BRCA2 alterations, uh, when they do have prostate cancer, it tends to be, me, tends to be more aggressive. That's to say Gleason 8 or higher tend to have more positive lymph nodes uh, and more likely to have uh, metastasis and poor overall survival. There is an increased risk of uh, risk to self of, as well as familial risk of other hereditary cancers in this population, again, predominantly breast ovarian and melanoma and sometimes pancreatic cancer. So uh, a quick note about DNA damage repair. As many of you all know, there are multiple ways that DNA can be damaged. There are single strand breaks, there's cross links, there's mismatch errors, and there's double strand breaks. Double strand breaks are, are the most uh, deleterious. Uh, and there's a number of, of ways that the DNA has to go about to repairing itself, and not the two most common ones that are studied are homologous recombination and non-homologous and join repair. Homologous recombination alterations are, uh, involve genes such as ATM, CHECK2, uh, RAT51, BRCA2, and BRCA1. These are the homologous recombination errors uh, and alterations in these genes are the ones that are associated with the hereditary cancer syndromes. So it's interesting to note that, uh, and this is from a, a paper that came out in JAMA Oncology in 2020 from this year, the SIMBA study at CIMBA, the Consortium of Investigators of Modifiers of BRCA1 and BRCA2. And what they found is that among all, these are all patients with BRCA1, BRCA2 alterations, but even among men with BRCA2 alterations, only 26% of them had prostate cancer. So it's certainly not uniformly accepted that if you have a BRCA2 alteration, you will get prostate cancer and that it will necessarily become aggressive. But certainly there's an increased risk, but almost three quarters of men with a BRCA2 alteration do not have prostate cancer. Longer term studies are needed to follow these patients uh, longitudinally, but it really does beg the question as some have advocated uh, the need for prophylactic prostatectomy or preemptive prostatectomy in men with BRCA2 alterations without a diagnosis of prostate cancer, I think the jury's still out on that of whether that has uh, value, unlike in, uh, in female malignancies. So how does one do genetic testing? Well, there's, there's two main areas of, of classes of genetic testing, as we talked about earlier. There's either germline genetic testing or there's genomic or the, 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 the somatic uh, alterations. The somatic alterations are taken from biopsies uh, and can run anywhere from between $3,000 to $5,000 um, and the, often done on formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue. Sometimes could also be done on fresh frozen tissue depending upon the lab. The germline genetic testing uh, is frequently done with blood or a salivary sample. Uh, and there are a myriad of different commercial uh, labs uh, that have developed assays to, 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 to do this. And one has to be mindful of the cost and of, and of course, what panel of genes is being tested uh, by each lab. So which patients should undergo germline genetic testing now, uh, in, in among the prostate cancer population? Well, I think the guidelines are pretty clear that uh, men with metastatic prostate cancer should undergo germline genetic testing because alterations in DNA repair genes could, could necessarily uh, make them candidates for PARP inhibitors and other, and other drugs that they may not normally otherwise get. 
Uh, certainly also patients with a, a personal history of Gleason 7 or higher prostate cancer with one close a blood relative with ovarian cancer or pancreatic cancer or, or metastatic prostate cancer or intraductal or cribriform prostate cancer or high risk disease uh, or a, a close relative with breast cancer under the age of 50 at the time of diagnosis. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, patients who have Gleason 7 or higher prostate cancer have two relatives with breast or prostate cancer of any grade or potentially Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. Uh, some have advocated the, uh, that men with introductory or cribriform prostate cancer also should undergo germline genetic testing, given that the, this uh, histologic subtype can be uh, particularly uh, aggressive. I would say, though, there is a, a need to refine some of these guidelines, and keep in mind that these guidelines are largely based upon expert opinion, uh, and the, they continue to be evolving. And, and the reason for the, the potential need for refining the guidelines or the study I mentioned to you all earlier that was published in 2019, of the 3,000, 3,600 rather patients, un, unscreened patients, in other words, patients whether they had, didn't matter if they had familial, uh, any family history of prostate cancer or not, 17% of, uh, uh, of men in this study were found to have a germline variant, but almost 37% of that 17% had, did, would not qualify for genetic testing by current NCCN guidelines, by the guidelines I just mentioned to you earlier. So almost a third of the patients who had a germline genetic alteration would not have qualified for germline genetic testing as the guidelines currently uh, are stated. So again, I think there's really a, a lot of work to do. So what about patients in whom, who have BRCA1 or BRCA2 alterations who have, do not have a, di a diagnosis of prostate cancer? What do we do about those patients in terms of early prostate cancer uh, detection or patients who are at high risk of developing prostate cancer? What should we do? Well, again, I think the jury's still out on this as well. Uh, there are a, a number of studies that are ongoing to see what is the best way in terms of a screening paradigm for patients with known BRCA alterations. And here's just one uh, published in uh, the European Urology in 2019. Uh, many have advocated a, a lower PSA threshold of three for patients with a, a BRCA, predominantly BRCA2 alterations. And clearly when you have a lower PSA threshold and you have this confined population of patients with BRCA alterations, you're gonna certainly detect uh, more prostate cancer uh, than you might otherwise. But again, whether this alters the long-term trajectory of the disease is still unknown. What about patients with BRCA1, BRCA2 alterations uh, who are on active surveillance? I, in my current practice, have uh, at least three or four men with BRCA2 alterations who are, who are, are on active surveillance. Uh, these are patients who on uh, biopsy were found to have Gleason 6 only. Uh, MRIs were non-concerning. Subsequent biopsies were negative or showed Gleason 6 only. And for the moment, there is no clear guidance as to how best to manage these patients. But if you look, this was a study published in European Neurology also from last year from the Johns Hopkins group, as well as others, showing that men with BRCA1, BRCA2, and ATM alterations do have an increased risk of upgrading on active surveillance. Uh, I think active surveillance is still an option for these patients, but one has to go into it with eyes wide open and follow these patients very carefully. What about patients with localized disease with BRCA1, BRCA mutations? Or do they do more poorly or not? Well, there are several studies that have shown that patients with BRCA uh, alterations, again, predominantly BRCA2, on the left, you have metastasis-free survival. On the right, cause-specific survival, show uh, inferior survival in, in uh, BRCA mutation carriers. But this is not uh, data that has been corrected or uh, accounted for for grade. We do not know if on a grade for grade, stage for stage, risk group by risk group basis, BRCA uh, alteration carriers do worse than patients who are wild type. We don't have that information just yet. We, there is data, as I presented earlier, patients with uh, BRCA alterations who present earlier with more aggressive disease but that's more aggressive disease by Gleason grade and stage. But if by stage for stage and grade for grade, there is no data yet that shows that these patients do, do worse. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there are a number of studies here showing that patients with altered BRCA status uh, do worse, but that's likely due to the high grade and high stage at diagnosis. What about family history? I think family history is something that we as surgeons sometimes don't pay enough attention to. Uh, I think gone are the days where you just ask, do you have a family history of prostate cancer, yes or no? You need to know uh, who had what cancer, when, where, how, why. Uh, uh, mother and father and second degree relatives. We need to know what kind, of pro uh, what kind of cancer. In addition to prostate, asking about breast, ovarian, pancreas, colon, endometrial, and GI cancer is important. 
age of diagnosis is important, and death from cancer is also important. Again, getting, giving you some, some sense of, of how aggressive that cancer was. And again, if one can draw pedigrees in your electronic medical record, this is also very, I think, instructive um, and is important as you follow patients over time and document their family history. So I think ultimately, there certainly is a, a need for the development of a streamlined approach for genetic testing. Uh, we, more information and better criteria need to be developed or defining who in fact needs to be tested. Again, we need better and more robust methods for assaying and documenting family history, particularly in the electronic medical record. Counseling patients in terms of consenting them prior to germline genetic testing and the downstream after effects. Uh, cascade testing as well as impact and implications it may have on their own health are important. Uh, we need to understand, particularly in our health system in the United States, about who will cover uh, the, the cost for these tests, uh, how, how does one order the test, and of course genetic counseling is critical because if you get a positive test or a variant of unknown significance, this type of information needs to be discussed with the patient clearly so they have a good understanding of what a variant of unknown significance means as well as what does a positive test mean for both them as well as for their family members. So ultimately, uh, I'd say recommendations for germline genetic testing today for men with prostate cancer are the following. Again, recognizing that this is largely expert opinion. Men with metastatic prostate cancer should be offered germline genetic testing. Patients with intermediate and high-risk disease with at least one close blood relative, as we discussed before, should uh, have germline genetic testing discussed. Or, pay, or those same patients with two relatives of prostate cancer or breast cancer should have germline genetic testing discussed. Patients with a known mutation in a cancer susceptibility gene in their family should also be tested. Tumor sequencing, this is somatic sequencing, should be done in patients potentially with, with high-risk disease. And I have to say you could also consider germline genetic testing in patients with intermediate or high-risk disease uh, without a family history of prostate cancer, and particularly those patients with intraductal or cribriform histology. Recognize a lot of this is a moving target. Uh, things are, are evolving and uh, we're slowly lo learning more and more information uh, on these topics as time goes by. Thank you all so much for your attention. Be well and take care. Thank you, Professor Palapatu, for this really very interesting and covering the whole problematic of, of these uh, uh, mutations in prostate cancer. Um, I would like to underline two things that we in pathology, in standard pathology, except OXP13 tumors, which look a little bit different and which are quite particular, we are un unable only on histology to make any comments on this. So we really need to go a little bit further. And I think uh, BRCA1 and 2, although it's not too uh, too uh, f uh, overspread, uh, I think uh, we still have a role to play in pathology, already giving the material, but also trying to find maybe some, some markers to make it a little bit easier. And I would like to say that we have really problems with the intraductal and the, and the cryoform tumors because all the studies most of the time lump both together and we do not really know which impact has very precisely cryoform and which impact has very precisely intraductal carcinoma. We recognize them, but uh, we're still missing a little bit studies to be a little bit uh, more precise in the outcome of the patients. Thank you, Eva. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, I think uh, the germline testing is uh, one part of a more complex uh, uh, puzzle that uh, reflects the disease of that patient at that certain time point in that certain host. And certainly the tumor specimens in its different locations will play a major role uh, assessing the biomarkers and uh, genetic and epigenetic expression of those biomarkers in the, uh, finally uh, helping us in making the right decision for the right drug, for the right tumor at the right time. So I think for us in the Department of Urology at the Medical University of Vienna, we have recognized that genetics will be uh, a key player in, in understanding and managing patients with prostate cancer, specifically with advanced prostate cancer, or unusual prostate cancer, as Ganesh put to you, uh, uh, patients that seem to have some clinical factors that are different, some pathological factors that are different, that are suggesting probably a more aggressive natural history that uh, uh, could be considered early for targeted therapies or other strategies that uh, would be uh, intensification of the therapy, uh, such as the early radical, uh, radical prostatectomy in patients uh, that seem to have a um, rather low-grade uh, disease or um, uh, targeted therapy, as I, uh, we will hear in a uh, lecture from Gero Kramer. 
Um, uh, we test currently patients that are metastatic and constriction resistant uh, prostate cancer. They all get germline testing in a metastatic setting to identify those that will fly through our first uh, uh, therapeutic um, strategies and move very fast to the definitive therapy. And we also test patients that present with unusual features as uh, Eva uh, told you about. Um, I think uh, in general, uh, genetic testing and epigenetic testing will be part of our repertoire in the management of the patients. And I think this is a key point for the education of the next generations of urologists. If they do not understand them, they will not be able or will not have the knowledge base to make the right decision for the patients. And uh, certainly this needs to be done by the clinicians taking care of the patients, uh, whatever level they are, be it medical oncologists, urologists, gynecologists, and so on, uh, and not uh, by a geneticist alone, because that will not be sufficient to deliver the care necessary to the patient. So our next speaker is going to be Wolfgang Leudl. Wolfgang Leudl is a urologist. He's the chairman of the Department of Urology at the Ordensklinikum Linz in Upper Austria. It is the capital of Upper Austria. And Wolfgang is, going, is actually also the winner of the Lifetime Award in 2019. And today he's going to discuss the role of high, uh, transrectal high-frequency ultrasound in the diagnosis of prostate cancer. Dear chair ladies, dear chairman, thank you for inviting me to give a talk about the high resolution micro ultrasound for the detection of prostate cancer. Here are my disclosures. What are the tools for the detection of prostate cancer in 2020? Still, the di digital rectal examination, PSA, and uh, the multiparametric uh, MRT. The new kit on the block is the high resolution micro ultrasound, a new technique based on a 29 megahertz uh, system. Commonly, six to nine megahertz probes are in use. It's a linear ultrasound probe with a 300% greater resolution in the axial and sagittal cut. The resolution needs 70 micrometers. What is the purpose to use the high resolution micro ultrasound? Conventional truss biopsy misses significant cancer, over detects insignificant cancer, and undergrades cancer. Therefore, it delays diagnosis and makes treatment selection difficult. We have learned from the MRI targeted biopsies improve all of these outcomes and allows patients to be followed and treated with imaging guidance. It reduces the harm from screening and uh, the treatment with a lower morbidity. What is the difference between a regular ultrasound and a micro ultrasound? You will see here um, an image from a prostate in a, a regular a 9 megahertz uh, truss. And on the right-hand side, you see all these fine linears uh, of almost specimen pictures in the uh, micro ultrasound. It's a totally different image you will see with the new micro ultrasound. It's a huge picture with very fine structures compared to the face of our imager. I hope you can see the video. Here you can see the ejaculatory duct with all the specimen around and uh, the vessels around. Is there any way to compare MRI and high-resolution ultrasound? Yes. You have the possibility to fuse these two images. So you find out uh, a Pirates 4 lesion could be a Primus 5 lesion. The pathology is proven a Gleason 7, 3 plus 4 cancer. Or, for example, 
here you will find um, Pirates 2, Primus 2, Pathology, BBH. What does Primus mean? Primus is a prostate risk identification using micro-ultrasound. This risk score is from 1 to 5. 1 and 2 are benign, 3 are intermediate, 4 and 5 are suspicious. You can look at these um, imagings like bright echoes, cauliflower, smudgy, mantled, irregular shadowing, mixed echo lesions, irregular shadowing again. In this short video, you can see the primus lesion and the biopsy and you see the biopsy channel after you have uh, targeted the lesion. Again, in this short video presentation, you see um, a Pirates 3 lesion, which is a Primus 4, and the histology is proven Gleason 7, 3 plus 4. Interestingly, you see already that there was a biopsy before. In this presentation you see a lot of glands which are not really looking um, malignant. It's a Pirates 2, Primus 2 and the histology is a BPH. This imaging is pretty clear. It's an MRI Pirates 5 lesion and also very smudgy and irregular shadowing in the um, micro ultrasound and it's a 4 plus 3 lesion. This uh, MRI Pirates 3 lesion is in the micro ultrasound uh, mottled, spotty, uh, patchy and uh, very suspicious um, it's a, a Gleason 7 3 plus 4 lesion. What is totally new is the visualization of previously biopsy needle tracks. You can see these tracks uh, four years after a primary biopsy and you know immediately where the biopsy were gone. What is the learning curve uh, of the micro ultrasound? If you are already uh, a user of conventional ultrasound, the learning curve is relatively short. It takes 15 cases compared to 100 to 150 cases in the MRI fusion system. Uh, and the primus AUC area under the curve to detect clinical significant prostate cancer increases after 15 cases in this study by Hindman. We were part of a multi-center study uh, using this new system and uh, weighing out uh, the problem with the learning curve. In this sophisticated protocol, there were four stages from the beginners to the advanced uh, um, images. Number of feedback sessions decreased from 21 to 11 number of required to repeat stage from 8 to 2. Um, uh, previous biopsies 21% to 31 and the rate of um, detection of clinical uh, significant prostate cancer from 40 to 57%. This is the matching graph and you can see immediately that from stage one at the beginning to the advanced uh, um, examiners, uh, it's going up very steep. In our own study, um, we had uh, almost 400 patients and the detection rate in total was 60%. Uh, 
and 42% of clinically significant cancer and the area under the curve was uh, 0.76 and this was our learning curve. We tried to analyze the validation of um, uh, prostate cancer uh, with a, a primus uh, system in the peripheral zone and the best results were at the apex with an AOC of uh, 0.83 uh, the anterior targets were 0.8 and the general was 0.68 to 0.83. Out of 5,833 biopsy cores, we found that uh, uh, Gleason grade 1, which is Gleason 3 plus 3, is uh, um, represented in all primal scores. Gleason grade greater 1, which is uh, a Gleason 3 plus 4, for example, and higher, uh, is also in Primus 1, 2, and 2, uh, if you find it in the systematic uh, biopsies. But uh, they go down if, uh, if it comes to Primus uh, 5. Uh, this is uh, Gleason grade 1. And uh, the red columns are uh, significant cancers. So Larry Klotz, um, uh, one of the proponents of the system in his lab, it was invented, um, um, inaugurated the idea to use um, high-resolution micro-ultrasound for his active surveillance uh, protocol. One of our main reasons to go into the field of uh, micro-ultrasound was the comparison of uh, um, micro-ultrasound with multiparametric magnetic resonance imaging um, to the fact that um, um, the facilities are not so many and there's a long, long waiting list and um, also the quality of MRI is not in our hands. So we went into a multi-center study to compare these uh, two uh, imaging modalities. And uh, we included 1,040 patients uh, with typical age 67, PSA 7, DRE positive in 20% prostate volume, 38 cc's, prior biopsy positive 66 out of 352, and the primus 3, 17%, pirates 3, 19%. These are the gray zone of positivity. Uh, if it comes uh, to the sensitivity, uh, this is almost the same. It's a little bit uh, superior, the micro ultrasound with a p-value of uh, 0.03, uh, but the confidence intervals are really large. If it comes to specificity, the difference is uh, almost the same. Uh, it's um, a difference of 0.3% overall, indicating non-inferiority of the micro-ultrasound. This table compares the performance metrics of multiparametric MRI and micro-ultrasound. Uh, for the de detection of uh, Gleason grade uh, equivalent uh, to prostate cancer, the sensitivity was equivalent, the specificity was also equal, the positive predictive value was comparable and the negative predictive value was uh, better for the micro-ultrasound. For the detection of um, Gleason grade three, Sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value was completely identified and identical. So the positive predictive value by Pirates and uh, Primus score was also equivalent uh, if it comes to 3, 4, and 5. So we are looking forward to get new results to uh, uh, compare and validate this data. The take-home message of uh, this talk is uh, quite easy because the high-resolution micro-ultrasound is comparable to multiparametric MRI in the first series. Uh, the relatively steep learning curve is very short. 
especially if uh, um, doctors are um, used to uh, trust biopsy and trust uh, um, examination. The systematic biopsy should not be abandoned also in this uh, modality. And especially young fellows in our field should get involved in this field so we uh, can catch up with the MRI and get back the expertise to diagnose prostate cancer in our hands. Thank you very much for your acceptance. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. This was a very interesting talk. And I wonder what the role of transrectal ultrasound is in the setting of MRI. So our next speaker is Nikolai Hübner. Nikolai is a resident in the Department of Urology and has dedicated himself to MRI in the diagnosis of prostate cancer. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I am going to give you a, a little uh, talk about the other side of MRI and also MRI and, pro and ultrasound fusion and what really are the benefits of combining urologic and radiologic expertise and what mistakes to avoid. So basically I will start with a short review of the most recent data, um, but I'll keep it short and then I'm going to show you some examples of mistakes that we made or I made and how to avoid them and maybe uh, make it easier for someone who is just starting out with fusion biopsy to not make these mistakes. And finally, the I will give you some key points that I think are very important if your plan is to do fusion biopsy. So I said most recent data, but still I need to put in the PROMISE trial as this is what it basically started, the MRI thing, or the, was the first big published trial on MRI, uh, which showed a very high sensitivity for significant prostate cancer, significant in the first definition, as Gleason 4 plus 3 or ISOP 3 uh, or more than 6 millimeters of tumor in a singular core. They also use the secondary um, definition with ISOP 2 or more and more than 4 millimeters of tumor, which actually lowered the negative predictive value of multiparametric MRI quite a bit. Um, there was a very big caveat in the PROMISE trial and that was inter-observer variability as even these uh, very specialized radiologists that were used to centrally review all MRIs only agreed in about 80% of the cases whether the MRI was supposed to be graded positive or negative. And to put this into perspective, this was a, they used just positive and negative. They didn't use a five grade pirate system. So the agreement would have been much less if you use a five grade pirate system. And this corresponds to a kappa value of about 0.5. And the reason I'm putting in the PROMISE trial here is there's a recent publication uh, concerning, concerning the patients or the tumors that were missed using, public, uh, using uh, MPMRI. And I actually thought it would be very, very exciting to see which tumors were missed. But <laughs> it still is, but it's basically patients with lower Gleason score, smaller tumor volume, uh, and lower PSA density that were missed by multiparametric MRI. Uh, then the second question that really always concerns people doing fusion biopsies, should we do targeted or systematic biopsy? Both. Um, there is multiple publications, uh, many of them con comparing both approaches in the same patient. Um, most of the publications show no significant differences, so, so the 4M and the MRI first trial. And the uh, best detection rate for ISOP2 and above uh, cancer was usually achieved by combining both approaches. Uh, the added value of uh, targeted biopsy usually being a little bit more. The different, uh, there's one difference uh, trial and that is the precision trial which was the only randomized trial which uh, randomized patients to either undergo systematic biopsy alone or go undergo MRI and then targeted biopsy if the MRI was deemed positive. It was designed as a non-inferiority trial and actually the MRI pathway doing only targeted biopsy uh, significantly increased the detection of significant prostate cancer defined as ISOP2, 38 to 26%. Um, 
the, a big criticism of the precision trial is one thing, and that is the follow-up of patients. And it is data that you find only in the supplementary appendix of the publication. And it showed that patients with a negative biopsy uh, in the MRI arm, so they had a positive MRI, they had a negative biopsy, were quite frequently about more than 70% sent for PSA, for regular PSA checkups in very, very short intervals. So apparently, the idea that we get from this data is that urologists that do a biopsy, a targeted biopsy only, do not trust a negative result. So it's hard for them to tell a patient, biopsy is negative, you don't have prostate cancer, go see your gen uh, general practitioner. So that is something that needs to be addressed when deciding what kind of biopsy you're going to do. And then another interesting uh, topic in MRI is uh, the question, ah, no, sorry, before that, the latest, uh, latest publication also concerning uh, targeted versus systematic biopsy uh, was a recent publication by a dude uh, which uh, included 2,000 patients and they all received systematic biopsy, MRI and targeted biopsy. Um, this is the most recent, it's also the biggest trial, that's why I'm putting it here. It also, I think, corresponds very well with kind of real world data. Um, however, they also have many limitations. The biggest one being that they had inclusion, they only included patients who had a visible lesion on MRI. Yet, they classified 77% of patients as PIRATES2, which would not be considered a visible lesion right now. Problem with this is they started the trial in, two, uh, in 2007 and there was no PIRATES back then, so the classification for MRI changed during the course of this trial. And that means, um, they also had a very large amount of visible lesions. 2.5 average visible lesions per prostate, meaning there was a large number of uh, cores taken from, from uh, lesions. And the, the, the criteria for these lesions varied, so that's why there are so many. And of course, since they started very early, this publication includes the entire learning curve. And basically, when, when we list the patients like this, you can see upgrading on, on systematic biopsy and upgrading of targeted biopsy. There's some areas that we should be very interested in. For example, these patients, we're happy that we're not, missing, uh, that we're not hitting those on uh, targeted biopsy. So these were patients upgraded from no cancer to ISOOP1 on systematic biopsy. This is generally um, patients that we are actually happy we do not diagnose most of the time as they should undergo active surveillance. And then there's these patients that were upgraded by systematic biopsy from ISOP 1 or 2 to 3 or 4. So this might actually have an impact on the therapy they are getting. If you only do a targeted biopsy, you have ISOP2 and you're thinking of doing radiation or prostatectomy, you might, it might actually change your course of therapy by adding ADT or by doing a lymph node dissection. So these are patients, and this is only 24 patients here really, um, where therapy would change according to the, uh, if you do a systematic biopsy. And then these patients, they are upgraded from ISOP3 to ISOP4, this can have an impact, it might not always. Uh, and this is the last group, this is the, the big positive group. These patients uh, were up upgraded um, using a uh, targeted biopsy. So now the final uh, trial that I want to talk to you about is um, biparametric MRI versus Multiparametric MRI and uh, biparametric MRI is gaining a lot of interest these days because it is shorter, the protocol is shorter, you can avoid doing IV contrast. This is a large meta-analysis of a lot of small trials uh, that were uh, conducted in this setting. They used 20 studies and some of those studies included as, as few as maybe 80 patients and one of the studies included was 82 patients with only 34 tumors detected, of which 12 were ISOP1. So really, uh, the data they used was not, was not great, 
but generally the outcome is there's no significant difference in sensitivity and specificity between the two. Uh, I'd still like to say that um, it should be handled with care. Uh, as I said, the median popula study population for the studies included was only 63. And some studies or seven studies only used systematic trust biopsy as the reference standard, which is in itself outdated. Um, and yes, another thing, MRI, the PIRATES classification only relies on contrast in a singular decision when this upgrading a PIRATES 3 lesion in the peripheral zone to a PIRATES 4 lesion if there's a contrast enhancement. So of course, if you use PIRATES as your primary endpoint and PIRATES itself does not rely on contrast, there is not going to be significant results because it, it doesn't change much to the pirates classification. Um, I would still argue, and I will give you some examples later, that you should not ignore contrast. So now some of the examples, mistakes that we made, maybe you can avoid these. Um, the, the examples I'm giving are very um, clear. It might not always be that it's this obvious or it's this um, I, I use the most extreme examples to illustrate my point, you will see. So one of the biggest dif uh, difficulties when doing a fusion biopsy are uh, anterior lesions. Why? They are usually or often missed by radiologists. If you're doing, doing machine fusion, um, there is a big problem because uh, the apex of the prostate is very often cut off by the radiologist when doing segmentation of the prostate. So it, by cutting off the apex, it moves the lesion backwards. Then if you're doing a transrectal biopsy, it will be hard to reach sometimes. So these are the most difficult lesions, in my opinion, to, um, to biopsy. And I'll give you some examples. Uh, and also, yeah, by aiming upwards, you're going to compress the prostate, moving the lesion even further. I'm going to give you an example. This is a patient. You can see the image. He was graded as Pirates 2 by an outside radiologist. Um, if you look at the diffusion sequence, and the diffusion is not used for the transition zone, but you can actually see that there is something going on. Now, this could be classified as a atypical BBH um, lesion, but here I think it's very important that the radiologist has clinical data. This patient presented with a PSA of 60 um, and was uh, denied biopsy because his, uh, his, um, his MRI was deemed Pirates 2. He came to our department, we saw this lesion, we biopsied it, and it turned out to be Gleason 4 plus 3. Um, then this is another patient, and I, I understand here it will also be very difficult to see, even for some very good radiologists. If you look at the diffusion, uh, it's very hard to see, but there's a lesion up here this also turned out to be a, a ISUP 3 prostate cancer. Again, clinical data would have been interesting for the radiologist that did not describe this lesion. Patient also had PSA of 25 continuously rising for about a year and a half. And another thing that will be hard to see for radiologists are what we call now rim tumors. These are tumors that kind of grow along the side of the prostate, the capsule, or the, uh, the change between transition zone and peripheral zone. They can be very hard to see, and you cannot, sometimes you cannot see them on diffusion because also there's artifacts from the capsule. So this is a patient. He has some mild changes in the right peripheral zone that you can see here. If you look at the diffusion scan, it's almost not visible. There's something on the other side that looks more uh, suspicious than this. Um, you, these can be cancer. And you should, if you see something like this, you should biopsy. And maybe an even more extreme example here, I don't think uh, it's very easy to see the cancer in the left peripheral zone. It's right here. I think it's visible. This, this was also ISOP3 prostate cancer. This is also very hard to biopsy because it's so close to the capsule that it's very hard to actually hit this. And this is another example. This patient, actually this shows why you should use all the uh, provided images. If you look at these images, you can see some changes in the right peripheral zone. 
These were also graded as Pirates 4 by the radiologist, which I think is right. If you look at the way the contrast enhances here, uh, it's kind of a sector of contrast enhancement, which very often shows um, inflama inflammation in the prostate. But this was marked. We looked at the images again. Um, this was marked to biopsy, but also we looked at the sagittal images. And if you look at the sagittal image, you can see actually a very clear cancer here at the back of the prostate, which actually corresponds to this change here that wasn't even described in the first MRI. So we biopsied that as well, and the right side was actually benign, or it was inflammation. The left side was ISO3. And then the last thing, I talked about this already, or the almost last thing, pirates ignores contrast. You should not ignore contrast if you want to do a good fusion biopsy. Um, there is promising results in these trials, but if you have it, it's not in the guidelines, use contrast. And I'm show, going to show you why. For example, this is a patient. I mean, here on diffusion, uh, here on T2, you, you see almost no changes. On diffusion, you can see it, but this diffusion image is actually not really usable because there is so much artifact. If you, if you know that there is going to be cancer, you know that here there is something going on. But then you look at the contrast image and you see this. Uh, and this turned out to be a Gleason 8 uh, cribriform prostate cancer that was uh, going up across almost half of the prostate. Uh, I'm going to put an arrow here, but I think everybody can see that. If you look at the contrast image as well, you cannot miss this. If you look only at diffusion and T2, you might have missed this huge tumor. This patient also had very low PSA, so it, it, he would have had a chance of having his tumor missed. And this is another even more, I think, extreme example. This was a very young patient with Gleason 10 prostate cancer he had 5.5 PSA, and I think, I mean, it's very obvious where the tumor is on the contrast, and it's not so much in the other things. And then the last thing, finally, BCG. BCG can cause changes in the prostate that look on very similar to high-risk prostate cancer. You see this, and the patient had BCG before. This can be granulomatous prostatitis. It's very often asymptomatic. If we know the patient had BCG and we see this, we still do a biopsy though. But why is it important to know? You can manage the result better. If you know the patient had BCG you, and you get a negative biopsy with this image, you can safely tell them, it's fine, you have inflammation, you can go. Um, if you don't know this, you might need to re-biopsy. So finally, the key points. If you're doing fusion biopsy, it should be a joint endeavor. You should talk to your radiologist a lot. And actually, uh, as a urologist doing this, you need to know the basics of MRI and pirates because you are going to tell the patient the biopsy result and you need to act accordingly. So if you know this is okay, it's pure pirates 5, but it looks like inflammation, it's okay, I can send him home. Uh, and also as a radiologist, you need the feedback or you're not going to improve. If you're not telling the radiologist, your pirates for lesions in the peripheral zone with the sector contrast are always negative. He's not going to improve. And finally, you should basically to combat all these problems, you should have a regular meeting with your radiologist, you should discuss the lesions, and you should discuss also the past biopsies with the results. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nikolai. Um, my question, do we always need a standard biopsy uh, in addition to the region of interest? Um, this is a very common question. I think in the setting of a first biopsy, you will need it in almost, I want to say almost, but in almost all cases. In the case of a secondary biopsy after a previous negative biopsy, you might, if you have a very clear lesion, for example, it's an anterior lesion, you see the peripheral zone is completely, uh, uh, completely uh, fine, and the, radio, the first biopsy was only systematic biopsy of the, of the peripheral zone, you might just do targeted biopsy, that is okay. But it also depends on the therapy that you have planned. For example, if you're doing a focal therapy, I will also always do a systematic biopsy as well as a target biopsy, 
because I want my cores to be taken from specific regions. I want to know if the apex is free of tumor so I can plan the therapy accordingly. So it really depends where you're going. If you just want to go for cancer detection and you know this patient is going for prostatectomy or uh, radiotherapy anyways, you might sometimes omit systematic biopsy in the repeat setting. Thank you very much, uh, Nikolai. This was a fantastic talk. Let's, uh, I have a question, and certainly there's a question from the audience mm -hmm. that uh, came us uh, through the internet. Uh, Dr. Pavel, um, who you probably know, uh, asks, um, he, he's trying to put both talks we have heard now back to back together, and that was also what Manuela's introduction was. What is the role of MRI and this, uh, let's say, this uh, high frequency ultrasound? And uh, couldn't we, by joining these two technologies, get a better performance in our detection rate? It's the first question. And the second question I had in on top of it, that is a common question you probably have heard. Uh, what is the difference between cognitive and true fusion biopsy? And is it as good? OK, so the first part, I think the high frequency ultrasound, if, if, if it doesn't replace MRI, and I don't think it will, <laughs> But if it doesn't, it definitely will improve biopsies anyway, because you can do an MRI and then do a fusion biopsy using a high frequency ultrasound. It will definitely improve, because this also ties into the second part. Machine fusion is good, but it has problems. As I said, you might just by compressing the prostate move the lesion and then not hit the right target. And I think if somebody is very good with cognitive biopsy, um, so if they really know the MRI, if they know where to look, then cognitive biopsy might be equal to fusion biopsy or to machine fusion biopsy. But machine fusion is, especially for learning, it definitely reduces the learning curve. And what it also does, it shows you where to look for a lesion. And when you know the MRI and you have the fusion in front of you and you see the lesion and it doesn't completely fit, but you see something on ultrasound, you see some kind of uh, hypodensity or something, it might help your cognitive biopsy having the fusion. And then actually having an ultrasound that can show you the cancer, if you have an ultrasound that really shows the cancer, that will probably even more improve the biopsy. I think the MRI will stay still as a standard imaging modality because it's more objective. The ultrasound is always in the hands of the user and if the user shows you some image, you, you can never be sure that this is the same area if somebody else does it or you see the same. So I think the MRI will stay, but the high frequency ultrasound will definitely improve the biopsy accuracy. Thank you very much, Nikolai. This was a wonderful talk and uh, I think this is an area where a lot of research is still happening and we will see a lot of progress over the next years. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk and for all the efforts you're doing in the department advancing not only knowledge in this area but also expertise and uh, care delivery. Our next speaker would be uh, Bernard Grubmüller who is um, also somebody who has a little bit of passion for uh, imaging in addition to uh, not only surgical care and, and, and medical care of our urologic patients. Uh, Bernard Grubmüller is a, a junior faculty uh, who uh, focuses on advanced uh, cancer surgery, oligometastatic prostate cancer, uh, specifically in advanced cancer surgery in, in terms of uh, complex reconstructive uh, components. And, and uh, the area he has uh, dedicated his time and energy to is uh, the, the role of a PET scan with PSMA as an imaging tool to identify the tumor and uh, to allow a better care for the patients. So his talk will be on PSMA PET imaging in different disease stages of prostate cancer. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear chairman, uh, dear colleagues in front of the screen. So as mentioned, this is the title of my talk today, PCMA PET imaging in different stages of prostate cancer, and those are the topics I wanna to talk about today. So I wanna shortly mention uh, staging of PCR patients. I wanna go a little, more, a little bit more into the deep uh, for primary staging with PCMA PET, and I wanna shortly mention also uh, how we can monitor systemic therapies with uh, PCMA PET. First of all, what are the main imaging challenges in the management of prostate cancer? If there is suspicion for cancer, we wanna detect clinically significant tumors and we want to avoid unnecessary biopsies. In the primary staging setting, 
we want to proper identify those patients who are high risk and those who are oligometastatic. If the patient is in the BCR status, we want to identify the site of the recurrence. We want to know if it's a localized or a systemic disease to go for risk adapted, target oriented cellular therapies. And also in the metastatic disease, it's all about monitoring of systemic therapies to improve the uh, outcome of those patients. Shortly, I want to talk about the BCR status. As we all know, there's a huge amount of prospective and retrospective studies that has been published uh, on this topic. If you go for a PubMed search with the terms prostate cancer, uh, PSMA PET, and biochemical recurrence, you will get 389 hits. Um, to make it short, to sum it up for you, the PCMA PET CT has shown a high detection rate at low PSA values as compared to other imaging modalities. So there is uh, in some series uh, sensitivity up to 90% with a PSA level of less than one nanogram per milliliter. This is also the reason why the PCMA PET has been implemented into the guidelines of the EIU uh, with a PSA rise of more than 0.2 and if the patient is fit for curative salvage treatment. But let's go to the primary staging setting uh, that has to be divided into uh, primary local staging and primary whole body staging. Uh, as Nicola Huber uh, already uh, mentioned in the last talk, uh, in the local staging uh, area, we know that the MPMRI um, performs excellent. We have a 93% sensitivity for clinically significant tumors. Nevertheless, a lot of working groups has been, um, uh, has been investigating the role of the PSMA PET in this status, and uh, it looks like that the combination of PSMA PET and MRI uh, seems to be more accurate than the MRI and the PSMA PET alone, which is also interesting that a lot of studies have shown that you can differentiate a, a quite well between different T stages with the PSMA PET. Uh, we have also done an investigation on this uh, topic in our center. So uh, we investigated 80 patients who were staged with PCMA PET MRI and uh, got uh, a radical prostatectomy afterwards. We had a cancer detection of 97.5% uh, and we could also show a quite accurate T-staging accuracy of more than 83% in, in this uh, patient's group. The key question in this regard is still, do we even need the PCMA PET for the local staging if the MPMRI is so accurate? Uh, this uh, was investigated by uh, this uh, working group to make it short, uh, they found in this study no difference uh, between PCMA PET CT and MPMRI for the detection of all tumors, for the detection of the index tumor, and for clinically significant tumors. But let's talk about the primary whole body staging. So the staging throughout metastasis, because this is a completely different story. Um, CT, MRI, and a bone scan, as we know, show a sensitivity and specificity summarized of 42 and 82% to rule out metastasis, um, which is mediocre. So that's why a lot of uh, studies have uh, shown at the primary lymph node staging performance of PSMA PET to sum it up for you, uh, all those studies have shown that the PSMA PET is more accurate even in the primary local uh, staging setting. Uh, for example, this one study has shown that the PCMA PET has a sensitivity for lymph nodes of 70%, while the CT shows 27%. This could be also be uh, this could, was also uh, confirmed in a prospective study with uh, sensitivity of 64%, which was quite uh, compar comparable in this setting. Um, what about the um, detection of distant metastasis? metastasis with the PSMA PET. Um, a lot of studies has compared PSMA PET to bone scan. This is just uh, one example um, where 30 patients were staged um, with known bone metastasis and they could show that the PSMA PET uh, showed twice as much uh, bone lesions uh, than the standard imaging. There was also a systematic review on this topic where 12 studies has been included with over, overall about 330 patients. Five studies had even histopathological correlation and in 11 out of 12 studies the PCMA PET was superior compared to the standard imaging uh, concerning the detection of metastasis. But then there is another key question in this regard. Does this even have a clinical impact on our daily routine? Uh, this has been assessed in a multi-center prospective trial from Australia. Um, what did they do? They looked at 300 BCR patients and uh, 110 primary staging patients, and they wanted to know if the detection of more metastasis or more sites uh, changes our management. To sum it up for you again, uh, they have shown that in the primary staging setting, the, uh, the management changed in 21% of the patients and in the BCR setting in 62% uh, of the patients. And this is the so-called state shift we are talking about if we are using 
better, more uh, accurate uh, staging modalities. We have also investigated this in 2018, where we looked at 120 patients who were already planned for radical prostatectomy, uh, and they underwent uh, a full, a full body staging with PCMA, PET, MRI, or CT. After uh, the staging, just 66% still underwent the surgery, while 12%, uh, uh, almost 20% overall were staged, uh, were shifted to uh, chemotherapy or radiotherapy because of distant metastasis or local advanced uh, disease. This is an example of a primary whole body uh, staging patient. This patient was uh, almost 60 years old with a PSA of almost 40. He had a Gleason 7, 4 plus 3 prostate cancer and CT and bone scan were negative. He was already planned for radical prostatectomy. In the end, the PSMA PET showed uh, that he had not just uh, pelvic uh, pelvic lymph nodes in the uh, 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 pelvic lymph nodes. He had also lymph nodes in the supraclavicular region. He had a small bone metastasis in the left acetabulum and the local uh, free B disease, which was not known before. But nevertheless, we still have to wait for the results of a prospective randomized clinical trial to implement the PSMA pad really in our daily routine um, uh, for the patient care. Uh, now I want to uh, talk about shortly about monitoring of systemic therapies with uh, PSMA PET imaging. As a background, we know that metastatic prostate cancer patients have a long life expectancy compared to other metastatic cancer types, uh, up to, to 42 months, uh, depending on the series. That's, that's the reason why therapy sequencing is very likely, given the variety of different therapy tools we have in this setting. So therefore, accurate prediction and monitoring of, of response are mandatory to change the therapy early in the resistance phase and to ensure the best outcome possible for every patient. So what are the established response assessment tools we have right now? Uh, we can use the biochemical response, which is based on PSA dynamics, but as we all know, uh, that progress can also occur without dynamics in the PSA. We have the bone scan, um, but there's also the limitation that the specificity for bone metastasis is ranging from 60 to 80%. And we know that CT and MRI, according to the RESIS criteria, have known deficits in evaluating sclerotic uh, bone lesions. But how can we use the PSMA pad for response assessment? What are the tools we can, we can, we can use um, um, to make it short? Uh, the basis for that are relative changes in different PET parameters. Uh, specifically, we're talking about changes in the standardized uptake values and in the PET positive tumor volumes that can be calculated on the, on the monitor. Um, first studies on this topic uh, has been published uh, already in 2011. Um, this was a preclinical study. It shows that PSMA expression in the tumor reflects the amount of living tumor cells and is not just due to therapy-induced um, therapy in, induced changes in the tissue. And uh, it also showed the study that changes in the PSMA expression predicts the success of a taxan-based chemotherapy. So that was the reason why the first study on, that was, uh, on this topic was published. Uh, it was from Munich in 2018. What did they do? Um, they had 23 patients who underwent PSMA PET CD before and after chemotherapy with docetaxel. Um, they compared the PET parameter SUV mean with the standard imaging and uh, changes in the PSA values served uh, as reference uh, standard in these cases. And what they could show is that the SUV mean showed a correlation to the biochemical response, so to the PSA drop in 60%, 90% uh, uh, of the patients almost, while the standard imaging correlated in just 50% of, of the patients. So we also made an assessment on this topic, so we looked at our lutetium PSMA, patients, 38 patients we could include who had PSMA PET before and after therapy. Uh, and to sum it up, uh, the PSMA tumor volume was significant, significantly correlated with the PSA response, while the RESIS criteria and the SUV parameters were not. What was also quite interesting in this is that we could show that um, the, uh, the change in the PSA value and also the change in the tumor volume was significantly associated with, with overall survival, which also strengthens our results. But nevertheless, there are some known uh, limitations uh, for this idea and access. Uh, we're facing problems that there are some, some metastases that show no PSMA expression, spe specifically in very advanced prostate cancer patients because of therapy uh, associated subtypes like the neuroendocrine differentiation, differentiation. And we know that the ADT can work as an uh, influencing factor because of PSMA overexpression after the initiation. 
So take home messages from my talk. Um, in the BCR setting, the PSMA PET is now implemented into the guidelines because of superior detection rates uh, in the primary staging setting. For the local staging, the PSMA PET works excellent, but so far it's not superior over MPMRI, but the combination of both methods um, seems to be a little bit uh, better in performing, but it's still under investigation. The whole body staging is clear superior to the standard imaging, but still they are proving prospective data, data that are uh, missing to use it in a, a daily routine. And monitoring of systemic therapies is obviously promising and innovative uh, access to this topic, but there has just been the first studies published on that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Bernhard, very much uh, for this very nice talk. Um, I just wanted to ask you a very short question. How often are these tumors negative, PSMA negative? Well, uh, we know that, that uh, uh, tumors can be PCMA negative specifically if they, if they have neuroendocrine differentiation. Mm -hmm. That's one part. And we also know that some Gleason-free uh, patterns can be PCMA negative is that if the tumor focus is quite, uh, quite small, if it's uh, less than five millimeters, and just the Gleason 6, 3 plus 3, it can be negative. You know, from some studies, that the detection rates depending on the cohort you're looking at. So if it's a, if it's a more high risk or intermediate risk cohort, uh, you will miss just one or two percent of the tumors. If you look at more Gleason 6 uh, tumors, you can miss up to 15 to 20 percent of the tumors in the, in the primary staging setting. Okay. I have another question. How does the identification of oligometastatic disease with PSMA uh, change your therapeutic decision? Well, that has been uh, looked at in two studies so far. So we know that the, the staging, the whole body staging is more accurate um, and, and that you detect even more metastasis, more sites. So um, as you know from the studies so far, 20 to 30% in the patients, we see a change in the management because of, of, of distant metastasis. And, and so most of the patients are then changed to chemohormonotherapy or new antiandrogen uh, treatments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gromer. Uh, thank you for not only the talk today, but specifically for all the activities you've been doing with the nuclear medicine department. I think this is the nuclear medicine imaging and also therapeutic avenues in the terranostics will be one of the key backbones of oncological treatment, not only uh, from diagnosis, but also from uh, uh, management of the patients and eventually follow up and so on. Thank you very much. We're going to go to the next speaker, who is uh, Geo Kama, that uh, probably I do not need to introduce, worldwide renowned and known for his uh, expertise. For over 30 years, he's not been only dedicated to molecular research in the area of prostate cancer uh, and uh, understanding the, the um, transaction or the interaction of immunology and, and oncology. That's where he started and over the years has matured really to, uh, over the last 25 years, to the foremost expert in uh, Austria and the German region and Europe on uh, management of metastatic prostate cancer. So his talk is going to be lessons learned from the f uh, plethora of randomized trials we have seen uh, recently uh, in uh, metastatic prostate cancer, how they shape our landscape, our decision making, and our management today already. Thank you very much, Gil. Dear colleagues, dear Professor Shariat, what have we learned from the recent randomized trials in castration-resistant prostate cancer? Well, we have new drugs in the two settings of metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. But which drug to use and which sequence? Non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, here we have new data on overall survival. Patients with high-risk non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer have a high chance to die of their disease. What is the definition of these patients? They have to have a PSA doubling time less or equal than 10, and no metastasis on conventional imaging. And, and that's a very important point. So if you have a PSMA PET which is positive, it doesn't change anything in that setting. Non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, it's a radiological entity, not a biological one. We know that androgen receptor inhibitors, and these are the three studies, the Spartan trial with apalutamide, the PROSPER trial with ansalutamide, and the Aramis trial with darlutamide, 
all showing a prolongation of metastasis-free survival for about two years. And now we have the data that all these free drugs also prolong survival with a hazard ratio of 0.69 to 0.7 free. But which drug to use? Probably darolutamide is different as it demonstrates low blood-brain barrier penetration. At eight hours past dose, the concentration of darolutamide in the brain was approximately 50 times lower than ancelutamide and 30-fold lower than apalutamide. And you see that in the side effect profile of darolutamide in comparison to placebo, where you see only a 4% increase in fatigue. And if you compare that to the other two drugs, to apalutamide and ancelutamide, they have an increase in fatigue from 14 to 33% with ancelutamide and from 21 to 30% with apalutamide. But you also see immediately that the placebo groups of these three studies different, differentiate a lot. If you look at what, what we fear in this setting, the mental disorders, you see that also here darolutamide had the best profile in comparison to placebo and in comparison, in indirect comparison to the other two drugs. If, since we have no head-to-head -head studies, we can do only analysis like the matching adjusted indirect comparison. And here, it was clear that darolutamide has a better profile in comparison to apalutamide with regard to falls, fractures, and rash. And in comparison to ancelutamide, with falls, dizziness, mental impairment disorder, hypertension, fatigue, and severe fatigue. We have new data on sequencing in metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. It's hard to use the optimal choice and sequence of current treatments in that setting because most trials were conducted in parallel. We have different comparators, different inclusion criteria, and different endpoint definitions. So the optimal sequence is undefined. And the, what we know is that the overall survival benefit is likely smaller in subsequent lines of therapy. And again, we have no head-to-head -head studies until now. It's very important that we don't forget one of the lines we have in that setting. And this is a registry trial, the largest registry trial prospectively done in metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, which showed that only one-third of patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer gets any treatment after first-line endogen receptor targeted treatment. And, and if you look at the data to chemotherapy, you see that only half of them gets chemotherapy. And what we also know is that there is a cross-resistance between the different endogen receptor targeted agents with no clinical response of one endogen receptor targeted drug after the other. This is the PLATU trial. And therefore, we conducted the CAR trial, a randomized open-label study of cabezitaxel versus abiraterone or ancelutamide in metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. And in the inclusion criteria, uh, we included patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer who, who progressed within 12 months on prior endogen receptor-targeted drug and on dozitaxel. And then the patient got either cabezitaxel or the other, the alternative endogen receptor targeted drug with a primary endpoint radiographic progression-free survival. And you see that the primary endpoint was clearly met with a, a hazard ratio of 0.5 and also the secondary endpoint overall survival was met with a hazard ratio of 0.64. 
with a prolongation of uh, life of uh, about three months. It was also clearly shown that the side effect profile of cabocetaxel in that stage was really good. Only, four uh, only 3 percent febrile neutropenia. And very interesting, and that is in according to the CS data by uh, Louis Gao, who has shown that the endogen receptor targeted drugs have some cardiovascular side effects. And in this phase three study, uh, we could see that the cardiac disorders were 4.8% with abratron or ansalutamide versus 0.8% only with the chemotherapy. And last but not least, we have the first targeted therapy in metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. We have heard that about 20% of the patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer have DNA repair defects. About 10% germline and 10% somatic. And we have PARP inhibitors known to be effective in other solid tumors. And so the profound study was designed comparing Olaparib, a PARP inhibitor, with uh, an endogen receptor targeted drug, again, like in the CART study, the alternative endogen receptor targeted drug in patients with metastatic castration system prostate cancer who have alterations in at least one of the genes which are involved in DNA repair. And, and what we saw is that of about 4,500 patients in about 2,800, uh, a sequencing with a biomarker status could be reported, probably a little bit lower as in the real uh, life, uh, surprisingly. And about one third of the patient had a qualified uh, HRR uh, uh, detected. And the profound study was positive, so imaging-based progression-free survival was prolonged by an impressive hazard ratio of uh, 0.34. And also overall survival was uh, significantly prolonged. And this uh, uh, knowing that about two thirds of the patient had an immediate crossover to Olaparib. These are the, the subgroup analysis with uh, patients with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. And, and this is the basis on the approval by the EMA. And you see that the data were really clearly showing a benefit in overall survival. So the question is who to test now, and we've heard a little bit uh, about it on germline testing. Uh, there have, has come a, a lot of, of uh, um, guidelines from different societies, but uh, in my view, the best one or the one I like to, to propose are the NCCN guidelines. And the NCCN guidelines suggested that all patients with regional or metastatic prostate cancer, and I think Sharok has said this, should uh, consider tumor testing, not germline tumor testing, to see if the patients are BRCA1 or BRCA2 positive, which, which, which would change our treatment journey because this is a prognostic factor. This makes me uh, being cautious when to change treatment. To conclude, or my conclusions, Anogen receptor targeted agents are the new standard in non metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. Darolutamide seems to have the best side effect profile. Efficacy and optimal sequence of agents is now better understood. And I think we should not cross over between different anogen receptor targeted drugs. We have now level one evidence that patients previously treated with docetaxel and one of the endogen receptor targeted drugs in any order should receive cabocetaxel. So don't forget chemotherapy. And we have the PARP inhibitor Olaparib indicated for treatment of patients with metastatic castration system prostate cancer and BRCA1 or 2 mutations, germline and or somatic, who have progressed following and the chain receptor targeted treatment. Thus, urologists should be ready to perform genetic testing. And I recommend to test as early as possible in any advanced prostate cancer. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Gero. Great talk. My question is, do you have a general concept in sequencing? We have a lack of head-to-head -head studies. I've, I've, I mentioned that. In, the first thing is, we have treatments for all stages which prolong survival, so please use it. Don't use endogen deprivation alone in a hormone-sensitive setting first. Second, if you uh, start in the hormone-sensitive setting with a chemotherapy with docetaxel, then switch to an endogen receptor-targeted drug, and vice versa. And then, of course, we have the, the, the challenge what to use now in a BRCA1-2 patient or laparib or chemotherapy. So my suggestion is if the patient is asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic and, and you have a more milder cause of disease, I, I would uh, go for olaparib. Otherwise, I would go for chemotherapy. So, but in the end, and as you have seen with the CAR trial, we have to do head-to-head uh, -head studies. And unfortunately, this has to be done uh, in the future by academic centers because it will never be done by the pharmaceutical companies. So what about the role of local treatment of metastasis? Local treatment of metastasis, that, that's a, a, a hypothesis which has been generated by a lot of retrospective analysis and, and probably the most important prospective, prospective study is that of Pete Ost, who uh, did a direct uh, uh, radiation of uh, uh, oligometastatic lesion with the endpoint to prolong endogen deprivation treatment. And it shows that this can be done, but in fact, the, the, the data were not very good. However, this is just the hypothesis generating. And greater, larger studies, randomized studies, phase three studies are underway, and, and we hope that, that one of these will be positive. But still now, I would warn to radiate all metastases you see in real practice. So please include these patients into studies and don't do that in real practice as much as, it, as I see it now. Thank you. Yeah, well, very short question. We do so many stains for you. Which is the most important? Sorry? We do so many stains on the slides for you, you know, with PSMA. Yeah, and so on. Okay. Which is the most important at the very moment? Oh, well, I, co I couldn't say that because there are a lot which are very interesting. KS67, mm -hmm. it's a very important marker because it clearly shows me the proliferation rate. And it's, it's, a, it's a difference for me if you have a 5 to 10% proliferation rate in a tumor or a 70% proliferation in the tumor. And interestingly, there is not much difference between primary and metastasis. Mm -hmm. Of course, PSMA uh, uh, and PSA is always very important because uh, if you do, for example, biopsy of metastasis, then, then it's, it's really, and you should do the, the progressive lesion, it's, it's very, very important to see if there is a PSMA expression if you go for, for one of the new treatments or studies with lutetium and so on and so on. And it shows us something about the, the aggressiveness. Um, the problem with newer endocrine phenotypes, everybody is familiar with that, so you should not uh, go for a treatment for a, nuclear, uh, for a newer endocrine phenotype just because immunohistology is positive. That's not enough. You have to do a molecular uh, uh, signature of that. And we have no standard with that. In, in spite of that, I use synaptophysine. It shows me at least something. And uh, of course, we have, we have the uh, hypothesis trial, the uh, potential trial, where you saw that, that immunohistology of P10 loss may be of relevance. But also here, we need the molecular signature. So I think in the future, uh, pathologists have to do the molecular analysis of, of these uh, uh, different uh, molecules. Uh, to get a better feeling uh, on, on the grounds why the tumor is progressing, and this may be a therapeutic consequences in the future. So it was a long answer to a short question, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gero. This was a wonderful talk. I mean, we could come up with a lot of uh, questions still that will matter in this very important disease state where we can make a difference in the patient's life. Uh, thank you very much.
um, colleagues and friends, we will take a short break, so you can go and have a little bathroom break, eat something sweet or something like that. It's Friday afternoon. Even grab your glass of wine and sit and relax, because I promise you, the next part of the session is going to give them from good to great. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be some kidney cancer, some, some bladder cancer in it with wonderful speakers. Let's meet again at 3 p.m. Thank you very much.
So welcome back. We are now going to move to kidney and bladder cancer, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Harun Fajkovic, who is going to talk about the surgical reality after Kamina. Harun is the vice chair of the Department of Urology, and the focus of his academic interest is the upper tract, the upper GU tract cancer. Harun, please. Thank you, Manuela. Eva, thank you. Nice to have you here. Sharok, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to talk about the kidney cancer, kidney cancer surgery. This story I will try to tell you today starts like 15 years ago almost, when I met Professor Shariat and he tried to explain me what he's thinking about the kidney cancer, especially about the metastatic one. I must tell you now, I didn't understand the word of that he was talking to me, but I had to give a talk for Austrian colleagues in Alpenländischen. Congress and they massacrate me there because I just t told them what Sharok told to me a few days, few days or a few weeks before. I needed like 10 years to understand why they killed me that day, but I survived. That was good. Now I'm happy about it because after Carmen, what I should talking about today, and that would be only a few slides about Carmen because it's a story, story in between and behind of that. As I told you, ERTC SWOG combined trial showed first First of all, that the surgery alone is maybe not beneficial for a patient with a, with a metastatic kidney cancer. At that time, it was usual to take the kidney out, doesn't matter which, which stage of disease it was in a patient. As you can see here, there are some beneficial findings also in a combined analysis showing that the combination between a systematic therapy at that moment with interference and surgery proved, showed some benefit for a patient. And from that day, we know that the cytoreductive nephrectomy is safe for a patient in a well-selected patient collective. We know to till now, till nowadays, but I will show you at the end why just till now and the future will change, I'm quite sure. We, we were not able to treat the primary tumor on the kidney with the systemic therapy we used to, we used to have. And we showed with the studies I was presenting, and as you can see here in SWOG and UCLA trial also with interleukins and interferons, that there is a benefit if you combine surgery and the systemic therapy. But as I told you, those data are 2001, that means almost 20 years ago. After that, I was facing a lot of oncologists, surgeons, urologists, telling me we have to make the cytoreductive because we have some evidence. In between, we switched to the targeted therapies. Now we switched to immunotherapies. We switched a lot and still had that paradigm, we have to take the kidney out. What Sharok was, what was telling me that time at, at, at Alpenlandischen, as, as my mentor at that moment, was like, okay, I don't have anything against that. Do a systemic therapy, but think about it at which time. When will you start? And these are the questions. I will focus my talk today on the questions, not if we need a systemic therapy, of course we do, but what is the main, main benefit for a patient according to a moment when we are giving that therapy? Not to excluding the surgery, but as I, as I said, before or after, after the systemic therapy. These are the things everybody knows who, 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 who dealing with urologists, if, if it's oncologist or, or a surgeon, doesn't matter. You know that you will have some local symptoms if you, if you, if you don't treat the tumor. You know that you will, you will have main source of the metastasis still in the patient. That's something you want to remove. You know about immun, immunosuppressive cytokines. You know a lot about of the biology of the tumor. And that's everything what you have to make it in a simple, in a very, very, very simple way to say, okay, one plus one is always two. Let's take it out and we will not have it. But what you also have to know that there are some arguments against the cytoreductive nephrectomy from the point of the surgeons. Everybody of us knows that nephrectomy can, can, can produce some really high morbidity even the mortality in a patient depends on, on a lot of factors which surgeons know. We know till now that only proven benefit of a systemic therapy in the combination with the surgery was interference and some selected patients in a common hour not, not benefit, maybe just, just to say it properly, it was not inferior to known combinations we are used to do. 
We know also that some of the patients with extended tumors will spend most of their time alive after the surgery, recovering from the surgery, even never getting systemic therapy if we start with the surgery first. We also so know that some of the patients will, will come to a significant progression after the surgery and also, also never get a chance to get a, treat, get a systemic treatment. What is the right way? The problem I want to say now is the main one for me, and this is the last sentence in this slide. Goal of treatment should always be cure if possible for the doctors. And we know now that we don't have any single patient which were, which, which were cured or will be cured till now only with systemic therapy. That's fact. That means we have to do a combination. If we have a patients which are selected for those, for, for those, for, those, for, for, for this kind of treatment, we should know what we do with them. And it's not only a paradigm to say, ah, we know, kidney out and then to Manuela. That is the old-fashioned way. We will switch that one together. From my point of view, the question is not whether surgery should be incorporated into the management of metastatic RCC, but when. And here you can see the arguments, pro and cons, for that kind of the therapy. Selected patients for surgery that are responding to therapy are sicherly the best one, as, uh, the best one which could be treated that way to get a surgery first. Downstaging facilities, we should not forget. It's obvious that we, that, 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 that we have in a lot of those studies we saw, even in a Carmena, but I will show you at the end, benefits for the patients with the reduction of the tumor mass in a patient. New therapies are less toxic than those I showed you with the good data, interferons and interleukins. That's also something we should not forget. And if you go to a cons, the most important one is the last one, my point of view. Unclear when to pull the trigger. And I will show you that on the next slide. Therapy may increase the surgical morbidity, we know. Local tumor progression is not responded, increasing complexity of the surgery, yes, but the last one. Imagine the situation, you have a patient and you start with a systemic therapy up front. And the patient is, like Manuela would say, a super responder. What should have happened that you pull the trigger and say, stop the therapy, I'll do surgery. In a patient who is a good responder, you don't need anything else, you will never stop. Other way around, if Manuela calls you back and say, do, I, I, I gave everything, he's, he's completely refractory, I don't have, any success, then he will also say, why should I operate somebody who, is doesn't, who doesn't have a chance to survive because it will, after surgery, also not respond? This is the main question for me in the moment. But all those hypotheses I'm telling here now are not including the new therapies. We still don't know. Even Carmena didn't help us that way because it was sunitinib. But I will come to that. Okay. Rational, for pre-surgical therapy, rational stuff is you have to select the patient, you have still a problem why to stop if it's good, why to do a surgery if bad, but anyway, you have an access to a tumor tissue and that's where we need EFA. We need a pathologist, like Gero said, in a prostate cancer with more tissue at the right time and the identification of the receptors or the pathways, we will maybe be able to start other therapies. For that kind, we need tissue and I think this would be a very good combination not to do a biopsy, to do a nephrectomy and uh, according to that findings in a tissue maybe to adapt the therapy. And of course we need the results from prospective trials. Again, nephrectomy for metastatic RCC in the era of the targeted therapy, that means sunitinib mostly, not a question of if but question of when, cytoreductive versus consolidative, that means pre or post. Before I come to Carmina, I will tell you one more thing according uh, on this slide. Since I started learning urology and giving talks and, and listening to, to other people, I'm always hearing the same thing. We need more data, best way would be prospective, randomized da, 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 to change our panel. Then we get something like Carmena, it is prospective, and then we say, we don't wanna know. That's also not the way how we should treat science because it's, it's, it's a double moral. I don't, I don't like that. That's why I, I took also some slides from Manuela. He helped me with that. I will, I will show you the, those two at the end. But for the introduction of the Carmena, before I come to the end, is 
just to remember you what was really, what was really a part of that, of that, of that trial. Actually, it was in non-inferiority study. That means the goal was to prove that the patients without nephrectomy getting only sanitinib will not do worse than the patients in a standard treatment like we know it. What the problems are is obvious from the beginning for the most of the people. It was not validated on the population-based data set. That means the patients in Carmana were really bad selected patients. As you can see it on the selection here, and I can imagine how that happens. It was also a very long time, a uh, trial was for a very long time opening. It was very, very, very bad, very bad moral of the people bring the patients inside and then, and then, a lot of centers and then, and, then, and, and, and. But if you take a look at the patients, according, according to maybe this, this data set best, well, it was a group of Fab Firas Abdullah. He showed comparing a normal population-based collective and the Carmena collective that Actually, abnormally, abnormally more of the metastatic, metastatic sites was in Carmena patients. Lung and bone, first of all, but also other one. That means the patients you, 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 are, you are analyzing in Carmena trial are not the patients you will face in your ambulance, not in average. And I can imagine how that happens. Uh, you have a patient from your private praxis, he would be maybe good for Carmena, but it's your patient, you do a fast nephrectomy when you're on call in the evening, and then next day you say to oncologist, sorry, we did a nephrectomy, oh. or the other way around, patient comes, has nobody, and you said, okay, pff, I don't know what to do with him, let's put him in Carmena, but he's metastatic patient from the, from the head to the, to the bottom, to his shoe, it doesn't matter, it's going to, it, it will go to oncologist. And that's the way how you should not run the science, especially not prospectively. However, now comes Manuela. These are her thoughts also. She helped me with that three one to look nice. We know that sanitinib nowadays is not a standard of care anymore. And we are discussing Carmena still. We have to face it. Okay, Carmena was too late. It was actually too late because of the long term how they, they need, actually they need too much time to, to give us that data on, on that data set. The problems you can face are also that 16, and it's a lot, almost 10% of the patients didn't undergo cytoreductive uh, nephrectomy in, in, that, in, the, in the arm of the study with cytoreductive and sunitinib. It's a lot. Other way around, you have sunitinib alone arm with 11 out of 20, 220 patients without sunitinib. I cannot understand that. It's not explainable to me. And also 38 patients out of 200 did undergo delayed cytoreductive nephrectomy. If you think back on that slides I show you first, uh, for me, logically, but not in a trial. That, that makes for me no sense to, to, to take it seriously at all. Uh, additionally to that findings, we know now from Kamena that the median overall survival of patients in non-inferiority study, uh, making apostrophe on that, with one metastatic site was longer in the combined group. Again, that what our oncologist or Manuela will say, do the cytoreductive nephrectomy, because they will live longer. But that was not the goal of the study. Intermediate risk patients with only lung metastasis had a longer overall survival in the combined group. As you can see, longer overall survival also observed in the patients who underwent delayed cytoreductive nephrectomy, that's again an approach I was trying to present you with, start with systematic therapy first and then do a nephrectomy, they also did better. And data on delayed cytonephrectomy in Carmena was not planned and biased by patient selection. That was also again a problem, why do you made a decision to do a cytoreductive nephrectomy? What was it? What was the trigger? Manuela told us one more, one more thing, and that was something I was thinking, but I was not sure. Now I know because we have an oncologist on board who is, who is a urologist, actually, from mentality. It's a probe trial open, but not a single patient, not a single patient in that trial in a moment. That means what we are maybe hoping that we will do immune therapy in the settings I was trying to, 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 to give you my thoughts about it will not happen, at least not next few years. We have still to make the improvisation how to deal with those patients. Again, for the fourth time, nephrectomy for a metastatic RCC after common study now, not the question of if, but when. 
Same, same, same story like 20 years ago when they killed me almost. Cytoreductive versus consolidative. Sharia told me 20 years ago. And one slide from Sharok. This guy is not Sharok, but he, he, make, he, he gave me the idea to use it. It's the oversimplification of the stuff. And that's exactly that what we are doing in a kidney cancer, metastatic kidney cancer since years. Don't do that, guys. Make the things as simple as possible. Read the data, and you will, the paradigm will change from itself. You don't have to change it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Har Harun, you. for your enthusiastic and critical view on the data of Carmina. I was wondering whether the, the fact that the study has been published and presented, has this changed in any way the numbers of site reductive nephrectomies performed by you or, or your colleagues? Yes, for two weeks. <laughs> First two weeks we discussed a lot because we, we, we were not sure, or, or let's say, till we understood the data, but actually not. No, not at all. You know, we, we talked about it also. At the beginning, you're unsure. Somebody comes from ESCO and says, ah, new study, new prospective trial, cytoreductive is dead. For two weeks, it was dead. Maybe two weeks, 10 days. After 10 days, it was clearly, OK, we cannot start anything with that. And our numbers stay stable. Thank you very much, uh, you. Harun, for a wonderful talk. Uh, Harun is also the one who takes care of these patients with MESO together in, in the upper tract, upper tract ureter carcinoma and renal cell carcinoma, as a, a congenial partner of uh, Manuela Schmiedinger, who uh, is, as you know, the foremost thinker and ex, uh, expert in uh, metastatic uh, renal cell carcinoma in the region and all over the world. In her uh, incredible 20 years, she has uh, achieved many milestones in knowledge, many milestones in uh, patient care, uh, not only uh, in delivering the right drug to the right patient in the right time uh, for the right tumor, but also understanding the patient as a whole and working on many projects. She's not talking today about it, how to improve the outcomes of certain therapies by ancillary strategies, be it uh, weight loss, sport, uh, nutrition, microbiome changes, and so on. So she's uh, really uh, somebody who thinks bigger than the tumor. And it's a tremendous uh, honor and pleasure to have her since November as part of our department in urology, which certainly makes the, uh, the distance for the patient shorter from uh, diagnosis uh, uh, across all disease stages to be treated by a team that is working very uh, um, energetically together with a single goal. And I think uh, Haron put it there, the goal remaining to cure the patient when it's possible or to turn it in a chronic disease at least so they can have a long uh, quality of life, adequate um, um, life of, uh, length of life. So uh, uh, Manuela is uh, going to talk to us about everything that has happened in 2020 at ASCO, ESMO, and how that's going to change our thinking. A lot of things are, ha have happened. And uh, the treatment landscape of uh, renal cell carcinoma in a metastatic setting is changing rapidly, but it's getting always better and better, and we are very excited about that. Approximately 20 years ago, or 15 years ago, we had the first change happening. We thought, that's it. That's the revolution in renal cell carcinoma. I think now we're seeing there's a lot of waves coming, and it's going to get faster, better, and uh, she's going to talk about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharok, and thank you also for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be part of this team and of, of this meeting, of course. So I'm now going to concentrate on the major events that uh, were presented at ASCO and ESMO this year. I'm not going to tell you all what has been shown because 10 minutes is just not enough for this. I'm, I'm going to focus on the news in first line, in second line, and also on the non-clear cell histologies and the sarcomatoid differentiated tumors. So let me begin with the first line setting. You know what we currently do in metastatic kidney cancer in first line is that we are using, as a standard of care, we are using an uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor combination. Immune checkpoint inhibitor combination can be either the dual checkpoint inhibitors uh, combined uh, nivolumab and ipilimumab, or it can be uh, pembrolizumab, the PD-1 inhibitor pembrolizumab combined with axitinib, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So these are actually the current standard of care. Nivo IP is going to be the standard for, or is regarded as the standard for the intermediate and poor IMDC risk patient. And pembroaxitinib is the standard of care for all IMDC risk groups. So here you have more choices. 
So what is new? Uh, both, actually, both uh, strategies were shown to be superior to sunitinib. nivo EP was shown to be superior in terms of overall survival response rates, complete response rates, a complete remission, and progression-free survival was numerically longer with nivo EP. However, this was not statistically significant due to the specific statistical design of the trial. Pembroaxi was superior in all three endpoints, overall survival, progression-free survival response rates. So we have seen, meanwhile, that this was not just a snapshot. Um, both strategies were confirmed, either at ASCO or ESMO. With a longer follow-up, we have seen that um, nivo EP remains superior in terms of overall survival, in terms of progression-free survival response rates. You can see the hazard ratio very robust and still point clearly toward the benefit of nivo EP in the intermediate and poor risk patient population. The same is true for pembrolizumab plus axitinib. A longer follow-up of 30 months has clearly uh, confirmed that the initial results were not a snapshot. We still see this benefit on, in overall survival, progression-free survival. The response rates up, went up to 60%, and the rate of complete responses was 8.8%, which is, which is quite remarkable after such a short uh, follow-up of only 30 months. So the question that remains open, not answered yet um, after ASCO and ESMO 2020, is that what is actually the role of these two strategies for patients with favorable IMDC risk? So nivo EP did not primarily address this patient population, but they did include such patients. IMDC favorable risk patients were included in the Checkmate 214 trial, but they consisted, or the, let's say the data were just studied in an exploratory um, way. What we have seen with nivo EP in the context of the favorable risk is that sunitinib was by far superior in terms of progression-free survival and response rates. But interestingly, overall survival was similar between nivo EP and sunitinib in the favorable risk, and the complete response rates were twice higher with nivo EP versus sunitinib. So it's quite different, difficult to choose here. But anyway, nivo EP wouldn't be your primary choice for favorable risk patients since this was not the primary endpoint patient population. This was, however, uh, included in the primary endpoint patient population in the pembrolizumab axitinib trial. And also here at the first analysis that has been presented at the first interims analysis, we have seen a benefit in overall survival also for the favorable risk group with pembroaxi when compared to sunitinib. And this is no longer true after longer follow-up of 30 months. Now we don't see any differences in overall survival. What we, however, uh, have seen at longer follow-up is that, the, again, the complete response rates went up to 11% with pembroaxi when compared to only 6% with sunitinib. So even if you say this was a subgroup analysis, overall survival is no longer significant, may I not go for a tyrosine kinase inhibitor in the favorable risk patient? Well, keep in mind that the complete CR rate can drive the treatment decision as well. This is basically what we want to see in oncology. Um, we want to see complete responses. Another inter interesting question that was addressed at ASCO this year is, if we choose for a patient uh, the strategy nivo EP, can we maybe just start with nivolumab? And if we see, well, the patient is not responding properly, there is not enough tumor shrinkage, maybe we could add ipilimumab later on so what is, the, what is the intention of such a strategy? It's basically because to some extent we would fear the ipilimumab associated immune-related adverse events. Still, this is a rare phenomenon, but it may occur, and we know that we need to have a very good management here, very good cooperation with our uh, colleagues from other departments to recognize and treat these side effects. So it sounded quite interesting, the strategy to start just with the, with the compound that is less frequently associated with side effects, and maybe to add the more dangerous one only in the context of not insufficient response. So three studies actually addressed this strategy, started with, a, um, with nivolumab as a monotherapy and added ipilimumab later if the patient had only stable disease or progressive disease. What I can tell you uh, right away is that don't do this. 
in clinical practice. In clinical practice, don't do this. Why shouldn't we do this in, in a general patient population? It shouldn't be a general concept. Of course, you may consider doing this in the individual patient for you, very good reasons that you may have. But don't consider this approach in a general patient population. Why not? Because the salvage response rate with the combination was only 10 to 15 percent in these studies, and the uh, salvage complete response rates only uh, uh, up to 3.5 percent. So this is just not the reason why we are using um, immunotherapy. When using immunotherapy, we are thinking of complete response rates in the era of 10 percent, 3.5 percent. For that, I wouldn't consider immunotherapy. And it appears, based on this data, that um, this concept of the possibility to achieve complete response, these steps of response, is something that might be related to the immediate um, use of ipilimumab in the combination and not to a delayed use. At ESMO 2020, we have also seen the introduction of a new player. We have nivo IP, we have Pembroax in the first-line setting, and now, very soon, we are going to have a combination of nivolumab combined with the met axle and VEGF inhibitor cabozantinib, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. This was a randomized phase three trial. The data were presented at the presidential session at ESMO this year. A randomized phase three trial in treatment naive patients. The primary endpoint of the trial was uh, progression-free survival, and the um, median follow-up time uh, at the moment is 18 months. Patients were randomized to either nivo EP or, cabuz or sunitinib. So one of the first uh, very interesting observation in that trial is that 95% of patients achieved some kind of tumor shrinkage. And what does it signify? It signifies that actually less than 5% of the patient has a, had a primary progression. And this is by far different to what we have observed with the other combination strategies, where primary progressors um, were seen in about 10 to 20% of patients. So this excellent response uh, translated into an objective response rate of almost 56% and a complete response rate of 8%. And in this context, I'd like to highlight again that 8% complete responses after a median follow-up of only 18 months is quite remarkable. And also, when you look uh, at the median duration of response, the median duration of response is 20 months. And this really uh, shows you that this is a very uh, special quality of response. It's not just a shrinkage. It's a, it is a response um, with a very special quality. Progression-free survival was significantly superior for Nivo Cabo uh, with 16.6 months and a hazard ratio of 0.5. And uh, also overall survival was significantly superior for the immune checkpoint TKI combination when compared to sunitinib. Also, this combination was the first um, among the others to show actually an improvement, a measurable improvement in quality of life. Let's now move on to second line. What's going on in second line? Is there something interesting going on? Well, we have seen this year multiple short abstracts on tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, being given in the post-immunotherapy um, refractory setting. And uh, what you can see here with sunitinib, cabozantinib, or tivozanib, well, the, there is some kind of response, but it's not really something that would excite you very much. What I found quite exciting is, and pl please bear in mind that this is just a, a non-randomized small phase two study, but still, when you look at the results of lenvatinib, this is an FGF and VEGF um, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, combined with pembrolizumab, you have in the post-IO setting response rates above 50% in a progression-free survival of almost 12 months. I think this data, you, when you look at the data, um, you think this is a first-line scenario. You don't think that this is a second-line strategy. And this translates in a median OS that has not been reached yet. So really good data, very exciting combination. We are probably not going to see this combination in the future in second line because meanwhile we have heard the press release that lenvatinib pembrolizumab was uh, shown to be superior in terms of overall survival, progression-free survival and response rate in the frontline setting versus um, versus the, the comparator sunitinib. So it's very unlikely that uh, we are going to wait that long to see 
uh, this strategy, to use this strategy. But for the moment, when lenvatinib pembro is not our primary treatment, um, then this is certainly a very good uh, um, way how to, how to um, undergo the second line scenario. So finally, let me address the topic of the non-clear cell and their sarcomatoid tumor. So when I say sarcomatoid, obviously I mean this can be part of any RCC histology. This is not just, um, this is a feature that can occur with any histology. And here I really found uh, quite in quite remarkable, the data that were published already uh, by Tarnier and colleagues. Uh, they looked at the, uh, at the role of nivolumab, epilimumab in the subgroup of patients from the Checkmate 214 trial who had tumors with sarcomatoid features. And needless to tell you, I would just to remind you that this is really a patient population that you would have considered in the era prior TKIs as lost causes. These were patients with very poor survival. Not so today with the U when, when treating them with nivo ipi, the median overall survival has not been reached in this patient with an hazard ratio of 0 0.45. The pro uh, median progression-free survival is above uh, 26 months, which is really remarkable. And when you look at the complete response rate, this was 19%. Patients with sarcomatoid tumors, unbelievable data in fact. And, do I believe that, they, um, that nivo EP is maybe a better choice than, let's say, Pembroaxi in this setting? By indirect comparison, I would say so, because we have also seen data with Pembroaxi in the sarcomatoid setting where only uh, lower, le less than 12% actually of patients achieved the complete response. So this is really uh, a strategy to go for straightforward in patients with sarcomatoid features. The last point I'd like to address is uh, quite a uh, rare disease. This is this hereditary leiomyomatosis and RCC. This is a familial disorder with germline loss of function in the fumarate hydratase gene that leads to increased levels of hypoxia-inducible factor, and this predisposes to aggressive papillary RCC. And there was at ASCO this year a phase one study, and you may wonder why do I uh, um, at all mention a phase one study, but wait a second and look at the data. A phase one study on bevacizumab combined with the EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor allotinib in either patients with hereditary leiomyomatosis and RCC or sporadic papillary RCC. The response rates in HLRCC patient was 72%. Uh, including even complete responses in the sporadic um, patient population, it was 35%. And the, the median progression-free survival also was quite impressive with 21 months for the HLRCC patient population. So and the authors concluded that bevacizumab allotinib should be considered the preferred option in this patient population. And of course you may say, well, why would I uh, go for that? This is just a phase one trial. But don't forget this disease is so rare, we are never going to see a randomized phase three trial. So to summarize what remains and what changes after ASCO and ESMO 2020, um, nivo EP remains standard of care for the intermediate poor. Epilimumab should not be delayed. Objective response rates and progression-free survival uh, are, intermed, uh, are uh, inferior to sunitinib in the favorable risk patient population, but complete responses are uh, certainly uh, twice as high. First-line pembrolizumab, axitinib remains standard of care for all IMDC risk groups. Overall survival is no longer better uh, than with sunitinib, but again, the CR rates are much higher with pembroaxi. The second line setting, um, IO, um, TKIs post IO is still according to the guideline standard, but the data are less impressive. New is a, a new player in first line, carbol um, carbozantinib nivolumab, uh, lowest rate of primary progression, longest progression free survival by indirect comparison between the first line players, and significantly improved quality of life. Nivo EP in sarcomatoid patient is just excellent, 19% complete responses. And if the patient also has PDL1 positive tumor, then the CR rates, rates go up to 22%. The second line scenario post IO, lenvatinib pembrolizumab, very interesting data, just a small phase two trial, but still quite impressive. 
And in HLRCC, if you ever going to, if you ever see such a patient, bevacizumab elotinib really shows impressive data with objective response rates of 72%. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Manuela. This was very impressive, like always, when I listen to you. Is there any marker you would like me to do for you to help you in your decision making? So the only marker that uh, to some extent may influence my treatment decision at the moment is actually pdl one expression. Mm -hmm. Although it shouldn't influence my treatment decision because we have seen in Checkmate 214 and in the other trials as well that actually um, PDL1 positive and negative patients benefit from the treatment. So, uh, nevertheless, we clearly see a benefit for those who are PDL1 positive and who uh, treated with Nevo EP. These patients sometimes have really, have really the median uh, response duration hasn't been reached yet. So, I think this is the would be my target population for these patients. But it's very important to know from where is this biopsy taken, from where do I have the uh, the information about PDL1 expression. If it's from the primary tumor and I'm treating the metastasis, I think it doesn't make any sense. I need the, the expression in the first place um, from those tissue, from this tissue where, the, where I, that I need to treat. Thank you very much. Uh, it further shows, you know, the close collaboration with the pathologists and, and, and us all, medical oncologists, urologists, and so on. There's a, a question from the audience, um, which uh, I think is the next trial that uh, should be designed. And, and you have talked about it a little bit uh, and designed things in this direction. And the question goes like this. Is there any role data for triple therapy? Thinking about, for example, Nevo EP, and adding a TKI, a cabozantinib or so on. And have you ever treated patients with a triple with a goal to push, you know, to that cure rate, the holy grail? So I have, there is currently a trial underway. This is the COSMIC trial uh, on nevo EP combined with cabozantinib, and we are actually participating in that trial. Um, it doesn't appear to be more uh, difficult in terms of side effects when compared to a general IOTKI uh, combination trial. So um, I think it's an interesting approach because the more immune escape mechanisms of the tumor we are addressing therapeutically, the more we can probably expect. It doesn't mean that every patient would need a triplet or maybe even quadruplet, but uh, nevertheless, if we, if we don't know what the patient's tumor escape mechanism is, the individual one, then of course we would like to cover as many as possible. Mm. So is this feas it is feasible, yes, it is a, there is a trial underway. I have also um, done in, in real life, let's say outside from clinical trial, a combination with nevo EP and axitinib mm -hmm. uh, in very late stage of disease reached really impressive uh, outcome in this patient. So I strongly believe in this concept. Okay. And is the adverse events driving you? Uh, um, in your decision making or the expectations or what is it? It's, it's uh, in a shared decision making, is it uh, yeah. individual cases? I yeah, I would say adverse events is probably the last thing. It, it sounds uh, maybe strange, mm. but when you know how to use these agents and uh, if you have done a lot, of, if you have treated a lot of patients, you know how to use these agents and I wouldn't be um, as scared. I, I wouldn't deprive the patient, let's say, of a, of a very, um, active treatment just because I'm scared of side effects. So then I need to find, it's my, it's my responsibility to, to make this treatment happen for the patient in a safe manner. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Manuela. I mean, I think this shows uh, the incredible expertise of Manuela, and it, it brings to the point that we're seeing in medicine as we're going forward in these aggressive cancers. Certainly, if you want the appropriate care, it needs to be delivered specifically in these disease stages by experts experts to understand the disease, experts to understand the biology, the natural history, but also the drugs and how to combine them and to deal with uh, uh, adverse events and manage them adequately. I think this is not something that everybody can do. As I say, don't do this at home. Uh, I think uh, this is also why we have valuable and tremendous people like Manuela and other experts that we've heard today and are in each institution pushing forward to this specialization in partnership with other specialties. Uh, the next speaker is somebody also very dear to my heart and, and, and somebody that I have to say from the first day I met, not only I was impressed by 
her personality, her charm, her intelligence, her uh, uh, um, uh, activities. But uh, in addition to that, she's been the foremost expert in neural pathologist. She's the reference pathologist that uh, for a long time, even I, over the years uh, for international patients have been referring to, to get second opinions in the clinical care. She has co-authored uh, at least uh, multiple books and uh, activities chapters, but also co-editor and co-author of the fourth and the five, fifth WHO edition, which is very important, as you know. And she's a consulting pathologist on everything from the EAU in bladder cancer, specifically focused on that. She's the head of the department in Paris at the Sorbonne, that is the one department that, that uh, I guess everybody worldwide knows. And she's been since September with us in Vienna, uh, where she leads and heads the, the GU pathology uh, division and has been uh, bringing us to a levels that we have never seen before. Um, she uh, um, has published over 400 articles, has a very high, high H index, and has been always trying to push the agenda towards areas that are unique, ununderstood, and quite difficult. And that's gonna be also this uh, topic of her talk, is the variant histologist. She's been one of the earliest uh, recognizing the importance of these variants and try to demystify them and understand their role in the clinical management. Thank you very much, Eva, for being with us today. Thank you very much, Sharok, for these really very kind words. So I will talk a little bit about variant histologies, which is one of the hot topics probably in Europathology. And we have, from a pathology point of view, a very good uh, indication how to report this. So there are several organisms like the CAP, the WHO, the ICCR, which is the International Collaboration on Cancer Reporting, who tell us exactly how to do this. And they will tell us, well, you have to say how many percentage of squamous cell carcinoma, how many percentage of plasmacytoid, and so on, is in the tumor. And then the clinician can, of course, make a decision based on our report. So, but the, one of the problems we always really criticized is, can we really trust in this histology? Is it really true what the pathologist is telling you? And of course, we have a kind of inter-observer variability, which uh, has been shown, for example, in a very nice study, uh, which has been published with 14 very, very famous europathologists. And if you have a very typical, for example, like here, uh, variety histology, like micropapillary carcinoma, and there were 10 cases, as long as, it's really clear and typical. Everybody agrees, as you can see, everything is really, it's red. Wonderful, everybody agrees. But as soon as it becomes a little bit different, like here, and I'm not sure what I would say micropapillary on both of those, well, you see, there's quite a huge disagreement. So as long as it's typical, you have 93%. But if it's a little bit less typical, well, it's a little bit more problematic. Uh, that's important. Why? Because it's really important because you have a urologist who will say, well, I have a micropapillary carcinoma in my, tu in my tumor, in my bladder, and I know if I have no metastasis, no lymph node metastasis, no distant metastasis, well, if I make an upfront cystectomy, the guy will be cured, he will survive. But on the other hand, if I treat him with BCG and so on and all this kind of stuff, well, probably he will make metastasis. He will have in 45% progression and so on. So there's quite a huge responsibility on the shoulders of these poor pathologists. And there have been also other papers which could show that something which we know right now, but this was really very early paper which could show that bladder cancer is heterogeneous. So you have something a variant histology in the re resection, but in the cystectomy you have something completely different. And they could show that especially these micropapillary carcinomas, as you can see, have a very low kappa. And this is a real problem. And we could show in a recent paper that uh, we have, of course, this discordance. We had about 20 percent, 18 percent, where we had different variant histologies in the resection and uh, then in the cystectomy. But one of the problems also is that we know that if you have a variant histology, you have less good prognosis. And this has been clearly showed uh, uh, around the, the group of, of Sharok, uh, that if you have pure uroceliac carcinoma, well, you do much better as well in recurrence-free survival, but also in the overall survival. So um, the next problem is, of course, this kind of uh, pathology. Shall we uh, consider only the pathological type or shall we also consider the molecular type? And this was a very nice study with 41 patients and you can see each line is a patient. 
And you can also see with all these nice colored uh, squares that actually quite a lot of tumors are extremely heterogeneous. You can have squamous, you have gl glandular and a little bit of sarcomatoid, for example, in the same tumor. So, of course, we in pathology can see that, but what do the guys with the molecular uh, typing do? And one other thing has to be considered that if you have a basal squamous cell carcinoma, um, and you let it grow, it will become more and more basal. If you have another virion, probably, we do not really know exactly, um, that uh, probably you will have, uh, if you let it grow, a squamous cell carcinoma in the end. So, in the end, what shall we consider, the molecular or the pathology? Well, that's a very good question. So, the molecular characterization is something which is pretty new, I would say, Come, came up 2012, uh, the first papers. And we now know there are several groups, there are five different groups, or six, depending on which major article you take. And we know that there are luminal and basal groups and the neuroendocrine, neuronal, which are a little bit different and which have really worse outcome. And we know that in the luminal we have three subgroups and in the basal probably these are the squamous basal cell carcinomas. And we also know that each has a part pathway which is different. And we also know that each of these groups has to be treated a little bit different and probably the basal squamous react very well to new age and chemotherapy as well as the neuronal and some of those react very well with immune checkpoint inhibitors. We also know with these consensus papers that um, we have According to the pathology and to the histology, we have different subtypes, which, for example, the papillary uh, show lots of papillary morphology. We know that, for example, carcinoma in situ is more often seen in the luminal uh, non-specific types. We know that, uh, for example, the neuroendocrine-like, uh, well, they have a very particular uh, pathway. And we know also that each of these groups have different sorry, have uh, different uh, overall survival curves. And some of those we can recognize, we can recognize these extensive papillary tumors easily in pathology and say, well, this is probably FGFR3 pathway. We recognize the squamous cell carcinomas. We can say, well, this is probably a basal cell carcinoma. And we recognize pretty easy also the neuroendocrines saying, well, okay, this is a neuroendocrine. It becomes problematic when we have just a part of this tumor and not the whole tumor with this kind of differentiation. And something else has to be considered. There have been, has been a real, uh, very interesting study with T1 tumors because one of the problems of the T1 tumors is that they can do very well, but they can do go very badly. And so the question is, do we have to do a radical cystectomy? And does it really improve the survival of the patients with this stage T1 tumors? And there has been a paper which said, well, if you have a squamous cell carcinoma or if you have a neuroendocrine carcinoma, this is probably something you should do. You should make really a radical cystectomy pretty early. Um, so some, some words about the treatment issues with these variant histologies because things are moving, of course. There has been a very nice paper recently really trying to uh, look a little bit on what can you do, which kind of chemotherapy and so on should be given on these tumors uh, with variant histology. So squamous cell carcinoma probably reacts very well with neurodegenerative chemotherapy. So this is really something which has to be considered. It is in the guidelines, so just do it. Second problem, adenocarcinoma, we do not know. We never have enough cases. We will never have enough cases uh, to do a real prospective study to say whether new adjuvant chemotherapy is the thing to do. But nevertheless, it's in the guideline, so do it. So afterwards, of course, um, the sarcomatoid look a little bit like basal tumors, so probably new adjuvant chemotherapy could be something very interesting. Um, and of course, then uh, we have the micropapillary carcinomas where we do really not know whether to do new adjuvant chemotherapy is the thing to do or whether an upfront cystectomy, the CT1 tumor, would be the best thing to do. And we should not forget that there are other tumors like tumors which have mutations like the P53 mutations and so on and FGFR3 mutations, which we do not recognize uh, in pathology. And these tumors probably have to have a kind of molecular profiling before having a treatment. So, but of course, the problem is um, what do we do with these tumors if they're just a part of the tumor, let's say 10%, 15% with variant histology and the rest is a normal urothelial carcinoma. 
So there has also been a very interesting paper which has been published recently saying, well, if you give an adjuvant chemotherapy to pa patients uh, who have a bladder cancer with variant histology and who have been treated with a radical cystectomy, well, probably it's really completely useless as well for uh, the recurrence-free survival as uh, for the overall survival. So probably adjuvant, if you have a variant histology, is something which is not very interesting. On the other hand, something which is probably pretty interesting is the PDL1 thing. Uh, there have been uh, studies which could show that if you give, nevertheless, whether you have a variant histology or not, or urothelial, normal urothelial carcinoma, you give those patients um, an immune checkpoint inhibitor, well, probably uh, it's the same if you have a variant histology or not in the response. On the other hand, of course, if you have very aggressive variant histologies like a neuroendocrine carcinoma, well, this is, of course, less good. So to conclude, you see on the left side, you can see um, our classification, and this is the molecular classification. So you see ours is a little bit more extensive. Ours is the pathology part, of course. Um, so we still have um, the problem with the restriction. So if you restrict pathology just to five or four, six subgroups, I think it's not a very good idea because you miss very important features and information. Uh, the same problem is for those guys than for us, where to put the cutoffs, how to treat them with so many or so many percent of our histology. Should we just treat patients based on pathology or based on molecular? I think they should be treated based on both. But um, we have no really good prospective trials with the molecular parts. So this is still something we always say we should do, we should do. But in the end, we still don't do it. And I think it's really Miss, uh, people will miss a little bit the chances uh, if they do not get both uh, evaluations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. A wonderful talk on a topic that is uh, quite difficult, new, and uh, certainly will be a, a major change, game changer in the management of uh, bladder cancer. And then the question I always had, you know, as this is becoming clinical reality for, for many of us in our decision making, we're trying to see how these variants will change and you're part of various guidelines, the ESMO, the EAU guidelines and so on, how this is changing our management. And you have introduced that into the guidelines for changing management. One that I, uh, you addressed in an article, I think over 10 years ago, was a percent micropapillary, and you talked about it today. But I, I wonder for neuroendocrine tumors, because for the neuroendocrine tumors, the, the, the change in therapy is not one kilometer or two kilometers, it's like diametrical opposed. It's like suddenly you're not talking about surgery, you're talking about systemic therapy first, mm -hmm. you're talking brain bone imaging, you're talking about totally different strategies. What about this neuroendocrine? What percentage do you think, uh, because some people think even 5% will be the driver of the natural history? I, I, I don't know, nobody knows actually. We don't have any single trial, study, whatever. Uh, these cases where you have mixed features is pretty rare. Um, I would say 5% is probably not the thing which will drive mm. the thing, but it depends also if you have micropapillary on the other side, so you have 50% of micropap and 5% mm. of neuroendocrine. Anyway, he will not do good. Um, so it's difficult. We don't have any data on that, unluckily. And would you use, uh, in this case, do you use any uh, markers in identifying the percentage to assurance? I mean, is, uh, do you have a, like a reflex testing? I see this, I want to find out how much of this this is really, how my specimen is really allocated? Yeah. Yeah, of course we do, especially in neuroendocrine, we do our stains and then we say, well, so many percent of the tumor express synapto or chromo A, whatever. Um, but otherwise we do not do very much more. I have, a, um, for me, it's quite interesting to, uh, to hear this uh, about the, the, the story about these variant histologies. And I'm wondering what is actually the clinical relevance and how does it influence your treatment decisions? Mm. Yeah, I think it's a very good question. And Eva and I uh, are discussing that almost uh, uh, in many cases and also in the guidelines. So uh, thanks to Eva's uh, research and activities in this and multiple research groups, we have gathered some retrospective data. And between the EAU and the ESMO, we have created some surveys to understand how those variants will impact the individual patient that is in front of you. 
I think what we can say with some, some sort of you know, belief now, maybe later it turns out not to be that accurate, but certainly in a non-muscle invasive cancer, we certainly see that the macropapillary, the sarcomatoid, uh, and the plasma sarcomatoid will change the game and uh, will uh, probably put you in a very high risk group and therefore consideration for immediate radical cystectomy. The uh, neuroendocrine depends again the percentage of neuroendocrine you're going to talk about, but certainly will change your management to a toposat cisplatin as primary strategy in different type of workup. Now, there's been a lot of Your debate. Audience, welcome to the sixth micro. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the other question is in the NIAGE event or response to cisplatin based combination chemotherapy. So, this is uh, something we have talked about with Eva and other uh, specialists. How, uh, for example, micropapillary are probably less likely to respond to cisplatin based chemotherapy because they're more aggressive, but not because they're more resistant. Right, that is a current concept we have, and, and data shows that suggest that. Now, in a metastatic setting, that will change. Uh, that is very difficult to make sense of that, and, and um, the plasma cytoid, for me personally, is the one that I, um, I would say I have the most fear of, because uh, its detection is different, his pattern of recurrence is different, along the peritoneal lining and so on. So that one, I certainly think a rapid a surgical intervention makes more sense than a systemic therapy upfront and try to keep that afterwards because the patients will need it. The role of radiation therapy in those settings in this, in this variance will be also something we need to address in the future because some of them are highly radiosensitive and uh, learning about it. So, uh, uh, as part of uh, um, moving forward, and thank you for that question, Manuela, uh, moving forward, uh, let's bridge to the next talk, which will be a pre-recorded talk for Melanie Hasler. Melanie Hasler is a resident that is in our department uh, working. Uh, she's a, she has a PhD in chemistry and a PhD in molecular biology, and we were lucky enough, she wanted to become a pathologist, you will laugh about it, and, and, and we, uh, I saw her talent and I said, you need to go into urology because you're gonna make that difference in urology because your brain works different than all of us and therefore it's gonna enrich us. So she's a, a urologist that is very much interested in genetics and epigenetics most of all. And she's gonna to talk to us about um, um, the different molecular subtypes, an area that is Eva's actually uh, expertise area, the molecular subtypes in bladder cancer on how they're gonna impact our clinical care as sort of a combination with whatever talked about, variants and molecular subtypes, these are going to be our drivers for decision making as biomarkers. Thank you. Dear audience, welcome to the sixth Michael J. Marroger meeting, this time held in virtual, uh, but I think you will still be able to enjoy the meeting and have valuable experiences despite the difficult situation we are currently facing worldwide. The topic I would like to present to you is about molecular subtyping in bladder cancer. So why is this important? As you probably have seen over the last years, molecular pathology and molecular profiling of cancer has become not only a significant research topic, but is paving its way into diagnostic workup of tumors and also into therapy decisions. For bladder cancer, several studies in basic research have shown that it is a very heterogeneous disease on a molecular level, which may, for example, explain why some tumors recur or progress fast despite seemingly optimal therapy. Others respond well to chemo or immunotherapy, but there is also a significant proportion for which systemic therapy does not work. The idea is by obtaining a molecular profile of the tumor, to be able to get more information on how the tumor will respond and treat the patient based on this information. So how does one get a molecular profile of tumors? This can be done by so-called omics technologies. Depending on what you're interested in, these methods allow you to get a full picture of the genetic sequence, so all the genes of the tumor, called genomics, of the modifications regulating gene expression, the epigenomics, all the RNA that is expressed, the transcriptomics, the proteins, the proteomics, or the metabolites, metabolomics present in the cell. This presentation on molecular subtypes in bladder cancer will focus on the transcriptome, that is the RNA reflecting the genes that the tumor is expressing. And as you will see, 
Bladder tumors with similar RNA expression signatures can be grouped into distinct subsets based on these RNA profiles, and these subsets can be associated with different prognosis and therapy response. In the past decade, several groups have published studies on molecular subtypes of muscle invasive bladder cancer. About 10 years ago, the Lund group were the first to report distinct subtypes. They called them Eurobasal A, Eurobasal B, genomically unstable, and so on, in muscle invasive bladder cancer. Other groups, for example, the University of North Carolina, the MD Anderson Cancer Center, and the TCGA consortium followed. All of them used, as you can see in the table, their own classification system and described different numbers of subtypes, from two to as many as five. Two major subtypes were described in all studies. In analogy to breast cancer, these were the luminal and the basal subtype. However, additional subtypes were also identified, and there was even subclassification among subtypes, as you can see here in the study reported by Masuka et al. from the Lund group, which, as you easily recognize, quite complicates the classification. What were the main outcomes of these studies, or what is known about the behavior of these, of these subtypes? As I already mentioned, there were always two major subtypes, the so-called luminal subtype, potentially arising from the luminal surface lining cells, and the so-called basal subtype, potentially arising from the basal cell layer. Furthermore, a very rare neuroendocrine subtype was identified. There were also different types of the luminal subtype, depending on whether immune or stromal cell infiltrations or certain mutations were present in the tumor. These subtypes have a different prognosis, with the luminal subtype demonstrating the best and the neuroendocrine subtype the worst prognosis. Also, the studies reported distinct responses to treatment. The basal subtype seemed to derive the biggest benefit from chemotherapy, the major luminal subtype did not significantly profit from chemotherapy, but still had a good prognosis, whereas other luminal subtypes did not respond to chemotherapy at all, plus had a bad prognosis. And the neuroendocrine subtype seemed to derive better outcomes from trimodal therapy. Still, the problem one was facing were the numerous classification systems with divergent names which of course complicates interpretation and implementation into clinical use. So, in 2020, a consensus classification for muscle invasive bladder cancer was developed using 18 datasets with more than 1,700 muscle invasive bladder cancer samples. Based on six classification systems, among these the one from the Lund group, the MDA group, and the UNC group, the molecular consensus classification now lists six subtypes. The basal squamous subtype, comprising about one-third of all muscle invasive bladder cancers, three luminal subtypes, the luminal papillary with one-fourth, the luminal unstable with 15%, and the luminal non-specified with 8%, a stroma-rich subtype with 15% and a rare neuroendocrine subtype with 3% of all muscle invasive bladder cancers. They also established a web-based single sample classifier where everyone can upload their own RNA seq data and determine subtypes. Okay, now let's look at the molecular features that each subtype has according to the new consensus classification. The luminal papillary subtype is characterized by FGF receptor 3 mutations, activated FGF receptor signalizing, a papillary morphology, and the longest median survival of all. The luminal non-specified subtype is enriched for active PPR gamma signaling and micropapillary variant histology. Among the luminal subtypes, it has the shortest median survival. The luminal unstable subtype is characterized by genomic instability and TP53 mutations with an intermediate median survival. The stroma-rich subtype displays features of luminal and basal differentiation, 
with presence of smooth muscle fibroblasts and longer median survival. The basal subtype also has TP53 and RB mutations, presence of immune cells and fibroblasts, and squamous variant histology. It shows short median survival. The neuroendocrine subtype is very rare with 3% of all muscle invasive bladder cancer cases, has a high rate of TP53, RB and cell cytogene mutations with neuroendocrine differentiation and the shortest overall survival. In principle, with this consensus classification and the web-based online classifier, it is now possible to subtype every tumor once you have obtained the RNA-seq profile of the tumor, which is a big step forward in unification and simplification of the classification methods. However, one has to be in mind that there are still several significant limitations. Due to the different classification systems, up to now no standardization for sample processing and no validation are available. Regular pathology reports, in contrast, use a standardized system with staging, and treatment is based on this. Another problem is intratumor heterogeneity. Samples from the same tumor might show different subtypes, and setting a cutoff for this is difficult. Molecular subtyping can also not provide information on stage, variant histology, lymphovascular invasion, carcinoma in situ, or focality which are important points for clinical decisions. Finally, it is a rather expensive technique, not available for everybody, and experts for methodologic implementations are needed. In our lab, we recently have started to perform molecular subtyping of selected muscle invasive bladder cancer cases. Here, I want to shortly explain the problem of intratumor heterogeneity in these cases. As you see in the first bar on the left, we performed molecular subtyping on the tumor of patient one and took samples from four different areas of the tumor. Three of these samples gave us the luminal papillary as the major subtype, but one gave us the luminal non-specified. The second strongest subtype was the luminal unstable subtype. The separation level which reflects how well the tumor is represented by the major subtype, was, however, not very high with 0.23. In contrast, for patient I with three tumor samples here on the right, all three samples belong to the luminal papillary subtype and the separation to the minor subtype is, with 0.50, much better. In general, the best separation levels between major and minor subtype were observed for the basal squamous and the stroma-rich subtype, whereas for the luminal subtypes, separation levels were lower. The next issue with molecular subtyping is the presence of variant histology. Up to now, only a few studies have investigated molecular profiles of tumors with variant histology, does not a lot about these variants is known. For the micropapillary variant, for example, a luminal expression profile was confirmed, and also the plasma sutured and the nested variant showed luminal features. Regarding the consensus classification, the micropapillary variant was specifically enriched in tumors of the luminal unstable type. Still, it is currently not possible to identify the presence of variant histology by molecular analysis. Up to now, we have exclusively looked at muscle invasive bladder cancer, but subtyping approaches have also been performed in non muscle invasive bladder cancer, although to a much lesser extent. I want to highlight two publications on this. The paper from Hedegaard in 2016 identified three non-muscle invasive bladder cancer classes, the luminal papillary, the luminal unstable, and a basal-like subtype, but a basal-like subtype not in relation to the basal squamous of the muscle invasive bladder cancer subtype. All of these had different prognoses regarding progression-free survival. A recent publication by Robertson described five subtypes in T1 non-muscle invasive disease. T1 luminal, T1 genomically unstable, T1 inflamed, T1 
T1 MUC and T1 early. Remarkable that T1 MUC and T1 early tumors had a significantly higher and earlier recurrence rate under PCG. Again, similar problems as for the muscle invasive subtyping regarding validation or intertumor heterogeneity exist. And what about OTUK? Here, even less is known about molecular subtypes. Gene expression studies in high-grade disease show that overall similar expression profiles to bladder cancer are present in UTUK, but UTUK seems to have a higher percentage of luminal expressing tumors with activated FGF receptor 3 signaling than bladder cancer, and in high-grade disease there are also less immune infiltrates in UTUK compared to BC which may have effects on therapy outcomes such as checkpoint inhibitor therapy or effective FGF receptor 3 inhibition. So, to sum up, I'd like to highlight again that molecular subtyping can provide additional information to pathology regarding the molecular processes present in bladder cancer. However, it still needs validation in prospective cohorts. Also, intertumor heterogeneity and the classification of variant histology using molecular characterization are currently potential limitations of the technique. Despite this, we can expect that in the future urothelial tumor samples will be categorized using a combination of histological and molecular features for patient prognosis and selection of therapies. Thank you and enjoy the meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Melanie. This was a wonderful talk. I think it's also wonderfully bridged from what Eva said to uh, what uh, the molecular subtyping in the role is. Uh, it's an area I think that I'm really highly ex excited. We've seen in other cancers. I truly and strongly believe that based on this molecular subtyping, we're not going to only understand the tumor better, but decide which, tumor, which treatment to allocate to each individual patient in that different uh, specific time of his disease, natural history. Um, and how to really garner that potential and translate it into reality will be the challenge of the next uh, few years. But I'm, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that this will happen because the, uh, this will easily link into the systemic therapies that are the companies in the industry are pushing forward and therefore they will need these biomarkers to really understand and direct us towards the therapy and that, that's, that's going to be uh, uh, something that needs to be done to, uh, to um, reach the optimum for each individual patient. So I think uh, what uh, we're going to have in the next uh, two talks, we're going to have them immediately back to back because they have something to do with each other, but yet they're going to cover a broad area. The, uh, these two talks are uh, sponsored by the Janssen, uh, who is our gold sponsor, uh, but they will cover uh, products uh, and, and, and drugs that are not uh, uh, Janssen products, but all areas. And uh, they're given by two excellent uh, urethral carcinoma aficionados and experts. Uh, the first one, Kilian Gust, who is our, I would say, the first uh, um, 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 expert that goes from surgery into the medical oncology. So it's a new type of uh, species we're creating, not being broad in, in neurology, but being on one subject, but crossing the line from early disease to uh, uh, um, the late stages and expertise in a field um, across different specialties. Killian will talk about paradigm shifts in frontline metastatic urethral carcinoma, and then immediately back to back, we're going to have Benjamin talking about management of metastatic bladder cancer, uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, management of early disease, how the checkpoint inhibitors will make a difference in early disease. I think these two together will tell us a complete story where the checkpoint inhibitors in ureteric carcinoma play, find, find their place and where different new antibody conjugates as well as, as uh, FGF targeting agents will play a role. Thank you very much. Sure, Dr. Cheers. Uh, thanks for this kind of introduction and also the invitation to give this lecture here today. Um, when we think about systemic therapy in metastatic urethral cancer, I think we have seen over the last four years a dramatic change. We saw that checkpoint inhibitors have been implemented in the first line setting, second line setting, and also novel targeted therapies have been already FDA approved. We do have erdofitinib and infortimab vedotin in that 
setting in metastatic of urethral cancer already. When we're thinking back for the last two or three years, for the first line treatment, we made our decision based on a cisplatin eligibility. Patients who were eligible for such a treatment received GEM-CIS or MVAC. Patients who were ineligible were based, decided on the tumor's pdl one status either if they do receive GEM-CARBO, if they were negative, or if they were positively tested for pdl one they had the chance to actually have been treated with atezolizumab or pembrolizumab. The second trial treatment began then after progression on or after first-line therapy. When we review platinum-based chemotherapy, we have to go back to old trials that showed for cisplatin-based chemotherapy, objective response rate of roughly 50%, a one-year overall survival rate of 60%, and resulted in a median overall survival of 14 to 15 months. If a patient wasn't eligible for cisplatin and he has received carboplatin-based combination chemotherapy, the objective response rate dropped down to 36%. Also, the one-year overall survival rate was lower, and the median overall survival was usually around eight to nine months. But does that really, really reflect the current state? When we're actually looking at phase three trials nowadays, the Danube trial, and look at the chemotherapy arm, again, patients who received cisplatin or carbon platin based regimens, we do see nearly comparable um, response rates of roughly 50% for both regimens. And one number that becomes very important later is that actually 80% or even more patients are non-progressing on uh, first-line chemotherapy. And that is something that we have seen before. Also, going back to the old MVAC data, also more than 80% did not initially progress on treatment. And something that we nowadays still see in, treat in, um, in checkpoint inhibitor trials is that actually patients who do only have lymph node metastasis and no organ metastasis or soft tissue metastasis are the ones who have a um, beneficial overall survival. Looking in the first line treatment, checkpoint inhibitors in cis ineligible patients. We have two trials, Invigor 210 and Keynote 52. Those trials evaluated atezolizumab and pembrolizumab, and compared to historic data of carboplatin-based chemotherapy, they actually seem to have a significant improvement in overall survival, resulting in roughly 11 to 16 months for those patients. But what about pdl one in the setting? Does the biomarker really make a difference? We don't really know yet, to be honest. The Invigo 210 trial did not show any effect of PDL1 in terms of response to therapy, while for Keynote 52, there was a significant difference when patients were PDL1 positive with a CPS of equal or higher 10. Based on those results and actually the ongoing phase 3 trials, Keynote 361 and Invigo 130, the EMA restricted the use of both agents to cis eligible PDL1 positive patients only. But let's have a quick look into the Invigo 130 trial. When we're looking at the cohort of PDL1 negative patients, we do see a significant drop in overall survival within the first 9 to 12 months, where atezolizumab is inferior compared to platinum based chemotherapy. But when we're looking at the PDL1 positive population, we do see that for both treatments, Patients have a prolonged overall survival compared to PDL1 negative patients, and there might be actually a little signal in there that an atezolizumab monotherapy might be superior. How about the Daniel tribe, uh, trial? We do see here that PDL1 does play a role, because in the PDL1 high population, we do, an significant, uh, we do see a significant increase of complete responses, especially in patients treated with a combination of dovalumab and tremolimumab. And what we saw from other trials is actually that patients who do respond on an immune checkpoint inhibitor do that for a quite long time, and that longer than being treated with chemotherapy. So there are several aspects how to improve first-line therapy in metastatic urethral cancer. We have trials that combine anti-PD-1, anti-PDL1 therapies with chemotherapy. We had the Danube trial combining two checkpoint inhibitors and compared it to chemotherapy in the first line setting. And those trials already have been published, while we're still waiting for the results of the Checkmate 901 trial. But that's really this upfront combination chemotherapy 
in combination with a checkpoint inhibitor or a dual checkpoint inhibition really improve overall survival in the first line setting? When we're looking at Keynote 361 and the Danube trial, both trials actually fade the primary endpoint. We did not see the hoped increase in, of response and the prolonged overall survival. A little bit different for the Invigo 130 trial, where we do see for the combination of artisolizumab and platinum-based chemotherapy and significant prolongation of progression-free survival. And the interim analysis of overall survival does at least show a trend at this time, but we are still waiting for the final analysis. A really complete different approach has been taken in Javelin Bladder 100. In this trial, patients who did not progress under platinum-based chemotherapy did receive an immediate maintenance therapy with an immune checkpoint inhibitor, Avilumab. And it didn't matter if patients were treated with carboplatin-based regimens or a combination of gemcitabine and cisplatin. Actually, both treatment cohorts do have a significantly improved um, median overall survival compared to best supportive care alone. And we're looking at the numbers of gem cis followed by Avalumab, we do see with 25 months a median overall survival that we haven't seen in any trials till that point. But we have to be aware also best supportive care in this trial is not really best supportive care. The comparator arm, a significant number actually did, a patient did actually receive a second line immune checkpoint inhibitor, so that makes this trial even more important. But how about the response to the initial treatment? Does that play a role? Do actually all patients benefit from an available maintenance therapy? I'm not quite sure yet. What we do see really a big benefit for patients that have a partial response and also patient, patients who only reach stable disease, the difference between the available maintenance therapy and the best supportive care is not as pronounced in patients who initially already achieved a complete response on platinum-based chemotherapy. But as Sharok mentioned before, there are also novel options in metastatic uv 3 cancer that we haven't seen before. In the first-line setting in cis-eligible patients, enfortimab, vedotin, and antibody drug conjugate, basically a targeted chemotherapy, has been evaluated in the first-line setting in cis-ineligible patients. 93% of patients did show some tumor reduction, resulting in a progression-free survival of more than one year, and one-year overall survival rate of 80 and higher percent. And patients who did initially respond did that for more than half of the patients for more than one year. And especially interesting from this trial will be the cohort K where patients are randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to either receive enfortimab vedotin or the combination of EV and pembrolizumab. And we know since years that also FGFR3 is playing a role in urethral cancer. We know from clinical trials that invasive metastatic tumors have in 15 to 20 percent of patients mutations of FGFR3, mostly on exon 7, but we do have this huge cohort of patients who have low-grade non-invasive disease where FGFR3 as a therapeutic target is still under evaluation as well. But coming back to the metastatic setting, erdafitinib has been evaluated in patients previously treated with platinum-based chemotherapy. And in these phase two trials, we do see a significant or a relevant really progression-free survival of roughly six months and the median overall survival of 11 months. And we do see that patients who initially respond very well, who do show a partial response or incomplete response, actually end up in a median overall survival of more than 15 months. But beside enfortimab vedotin, another antibody drug conjugate, zacitimab givotican, has been evaluated in metastatic and previously treated metastatic urethral cancer. And we do see quite comparable results. We do have a median progression-free survival of five to six months. We do have a median overall survival of 10 to 12 months, and that is really relevant in this heavily pretreated patient population. So how could a future algorithm for the frontline metastatic urethral cancer treatment look like nowadays? I think still we evaluate, is a patient really platinum eligible? If he's cisplatinum eligible, he still should receive a, either 
a combination chemotherapy of gemcitabine and cisplatin, or MVAC. If you have a patient that is ineligible for cisplatin, based on the PD-1 status, you should decide if they are positive to give him atezor or pembro, or if they are negative, gemcarbo. But I think also there's a patient population with a high tumor burden that are PD-1 positive that might actually benefit from an upfront chemotherapy with gemcarbo. Very important for this patient population who has been treated with an initial uh, platin-based combination chemotherapy. Those patients who do not progress under therapy, those patients in the future will be most likely treated with avelumab. But there might also be a small cohort of patients with incomplete response um, who might just be followed up because the effect of avelumab is maybe not as um, announced as in the other patients. But patients who do actually have progressed on first-line therapy, either if it's gemcarbo or a checkpoint inhibitor with atezor and pembrolizumab, they will then move on to second-line therapy. But we shouldn't forget about the small patient cohort of patients who are actually platinum ineligible upfront at time of diagnosis. pd one positive patients also do have the option to ha be treated with atezolizumab or pembrolizumab. Then if they progress, maybe they're still available for another second-line option. But the small cohort that is really platinum ineligible and pd one negative, those patients most likely do benefit most from best supportive care. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kilian. Uh, this was a wonderful talk uh, covering an area that has a lot of uh, uh, novelties, a lot of exciting things that are happening. Um, before we, we give some questions and a wonderful number of questions from the audience, we would like to uh, uh, attach a second and uh, maybe ask the questions of both of you together. Um, the next speaker is, uh, as you know, Benjamin Pradera. He's uh, from France. He's uh, spending his uh, uh, year of research fellowship with us, and uh, he's been one of the foremost uh, intellectuals in a young French society, uh, moving the field forward, specifically in ureteric carcinoma, but as well in stones. So two uh, qu quite unlikely areas that meet together in, in this personality. He's not only a charming, wonderful person, but very knowledgeable and, uh, and very uh, enthusiastic about the role of these drugs in early disease. And that's going to be the co topic of his uh, talk, checkpoint inhibition in non-metastatic bladder cancer. What's happening? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you to all the faculty to give, give me the opportunity to get this talk today. Uh, I've been here two years ago for the first time in Vienna um, as um, on the floor, uh, looking at all these amazing um, discussions. So today I'm very pleased to present you why the CPI are a game changer in the making. So in non-metastatic bladder cancer, okay, but when to use this CPI in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, in neoadjuvant setting, in the perioperative settings, or in an adjuvant settings? That's a question we, we should have right now. So it's a game changer, but could we use this CPI for high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer? And yes, we can. Similarities in the genomic landscapes between high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and muscle invasive bladder cancer have been shown also, especially in T1 versus muscle invasive bladder cancer and in high-grade non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, we have found that DNA damage repair alteration are more frequent in this population of tumor and are associated with an increased mutational load. And this association between um, a higher mutational burden and a predicted neoantigen uh, burden are uh, linked to a pd one pdl one response. This pdl one expression is associated with BCG resistance, and we know that in more than 25% of the patient, we will see an adaptative immune A resistance, uh, which is a mechanism of BCG failure, and the pdl one expression has been a predictor to response to BCG. So it's a game changer, but do we have data on this high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And yes, lucky us, in 2020, we had a lot of data on it. With the Keynote 057, which has been uh, updated for uh, the second year of follow-up in the cohort A, sorry, with pembrolizumab for two years, 
with more than 76, uh, 96 sorry, patients. The complete response rate at three months was around 40.6%. Uh, with a median follow-up of 28 months, we had more than a duration of complete response of 16.2 months. There were no progression to muscle invasive bladder cancer or metastatic urotel carcinoma. All failure remain in muscle invasive bladder cancer in these three months. We saw that also 85% uh, of the failures happened at three months, and so there were no delay in radical cystectomy. Anyway, among the, the complete response patients at three months, only 46% of them had no recurrences at 12 months. So when we calculate the recurrence-free survival in intention to treat of this cohort, uh, uh, less than 20% of them had uh, RFS at 12 months. Moreover, the adverse events were around 65% with uh, pembrolizumab. Uh, in the, there were, after our 37% uh, of cystectomy, and in these patients still, an upstaging in three patients, meaning 8%, so it's not really a T, uh, no T2, but some patients were upgraded after uh, cystectomy. So similar study with uh, um, atelizumab in phase two trial with the same primary endpoint of uh, complete response at six months these times, and in around these 76 patients who have been uh, evaluated in the cohort, uh, one patient had a recurrence of T2, and when you see, look at the complete response rate at three months, it was similar to uh, pembrolizumab uh, with 42% in this study. But when we look at the complete response rate at six months, which was the pre-planned um, primary endpoint, there were only 27% of them who had a complete response, and the adverse events were uh, in 83% of them. So a game changer in the meeting, yes, but do we have data for using CPI plus uh, BCG in the same time, so earlier than in the two previous study. Not now, but a lot of studies are enrolling patients actually, some with BCG naive patients as Potomac with Durvalumab or Alban with uh, BCG plus Aterozolizumab. And in BCG and responsive uh, patients, the most uh, well, um, biggest studies are uh, the Keynote 676 uh, with Pembro plus BCG and Adapt Bladder with Durvalumab, including an arm with a radiotherapy. So the take home messages in CPI for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer are, so the BCG and responsive patients are um, still uh, required radical cystectomy because nearly 70% of the patients are experiencing recurrence at 12 months in these new studies with CPI. And the toxicity in these patients in as who are asymptomatic are not um, negligible for now. The duration of response will be the most relevant clinical efficacy endpoints that we have to look after in the next years. Use, the use of earlier uh, immunotherapy in combination with BCG would have better uh, results and endovesical treatment uh, could be a, a better option. We will have to also to overcome immune escape and select best responders. Uh, could we use the CPI in an AR driven settings? Yes, we can. CPI are really interesting in these settings, especially because we're gonna uh, have a wider eligible population uh, for this patient and it's surgically safe. It has been proven in lots of studies and it's recommended actually in the AU guidelines. Uh, of course, in, uh, involved patients in clinical trials. But okay, but how to use this new adjuvant treatment as CPI and do we have data on it? And yes, we have. The so CPI could be used as single agent and we have two great study with atelizumab and pembrolizumab in the phase two trials, Abacus who, uh, um, assessed atezolizumab with a complete response rate of 31% uh, in CT3-T4. Um, uh, it was interesting to see that uh, biomarkers were not predictors of response uh, with atezolizumab, which is different from the metastatic uh, setting. The other study is uh, a pure zero one with pembrolizumab who found um, similar complete response rates of 37%, but here more, uh, more uh, PD one positive patient were more uh, responders uh, than the other one. We can also combine this CPI with chemotherapy, with nivolumab, for example, in the BLAST1 study, who found
found a complete response rate of 49% when it's combined to uh, gemcisplatin, uh, which is higher than um, CPI alone. And similarly, in the GU14188, pembrolizumab plus gemcitabine cisplatin found a great improvement in terms of complete response rate of 45%. Other combinations are on their way as the Nabucco, which improving, uh, which um, assess Nivo EP plus in cis ineligible uh, patients with similar complete response rates, but con in contrast to the, the other studies where CPI were used as monotherapy in this combined, uh, the complete response rate was still independent, especially in CD8 plus uh, two more. The Dutreno trial is also an interesting one who were assessing duvalumab and tremelumab versus chemotherapy and especially uh, comparing uh, t different type, type of tumor, hot tumors and cold tumors. And they found similar results in the combination of immunotherapy versus chemotherapy with 36% of PT0. There were no very real biomarkers, so it's still important to find and identify this patient who respond to chemotherapy because we found more than 69% of PT0 in these cold tumors. So it's a, game, it's a game changer in the making, but could we use this CPI also as an adjuvant settings? Yes, because it's recommended in the guidelines, still as a clinical, uh, in a clinical trial. We have some studies uh, who have been shown some interesting results I've, as Invigor 010, where atezolizumab was uh, compared to observation, but there were no benefits to use atezolizumab as an adjuvant treatment in uh, intention to treat cohort and it was the same results for the pdl one cohort. There were no benefit of atezolizumab on, pri on primary and secondary endpoints. Therefore, we still have two other studies which we are waiting for the definitive results. So Invigo was negative, Checkmate 274 is probably positive, it has been published, but still we do not have the data for that and we are still waiting for the ambassador study. So do we have data? for this CPI, but perioperatively, in adjuvant and neoadjuvant treatments. For now, we do not have it, but we are still waiting for it. We have a lot of study on this, uh, in this setting, especially in combination with durvalumab, nivolumab, and pembrolizumab. So as a take home message, to follow, if we should follow the guidelines and use CPI and including our patient in clinical trial setting. Cisplatin-based chemo is still the standard for adjuvant and neoadjuvant for now, but CPR are big, becoming pivotal for the treatment of non-metastatic uh, urotor carcinoma. It appears to be a glimmer of hope for progress in this management. Many questions still need better answer, about the setting, about the combination of treatment, and still the safety of this treatment, especially in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And we are highly ne needing bi new biomarkers to drive on this therapy. For concluding and opening the perspectives of this uh, CPI in non-metastatic bladder cancer, I would like to give, me, give you my French uh, vision of the perspective where CPI, I, are like wine uh, in a meal. I think uh, we have to think about the combination and the best combination of this CPI uh, as, a, a, as a great standard, and this standard could be even better in combination with chemotherapy, and that could be probably one of the next results for this, and also the triplet treatments uh, improving um, according to uh, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and new drugs to get even a better, um, a better answer for our patients. So CPI are for non-metastatic urotor carcinoma, what wine sparing are for meal. We have to select our patients and select the best time for, uh, for treating them. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Um, two things, I think we should be extremely careful when we talk about BCG recurrence, and I think many people talk about BCG recurrence uh, without really meaning the real definition. I think um, the second thing is, how do you sort it out now? You have a patient in front of you with this kind of setting, so what are you going to do? <laughs> Look at the pathology report and say, well, 
Uh, for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, I, I, I think for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, there is a lot of different variables to take into account, especially uh, according to the pathological reports and uh, the, LV, the LVI, the variants of histology, all these questions are still uh, not really uh, looked into the, into the different studies. So for now, I still try to uh, propose this kind of patient in trials, but it's still uh, it, we are still looking for a better precision medicine, and and found the good the good way is still is still complicated. Thank you very much. Um, the, I think uh, a lot of progress has been made. You've talked about a lot of issues, and and you know, I, I look at pembrolizumab in in, uh, in the keynote 52. Um, and uh, uh, keynote 57, sorry, and, and, and a look, it has been approved by the FDA for a year approximately now. I talked to my colleagues in the, in the US and they say it's rarely used. And now the, the question that uh, I think Eva is bringing to the point is certainly biomarkers could help us looking into the future, but already now we need a concept of the BCG unresponsive, or let's say even the, the heterogeneous group of T1s or the heterogeneous group of high risk cancers, how can we better risk stratify those? Because probably some of them would benefit only for local therapy, and some of them would benefit from pembrolizumab because they have probably a micrometastatic disease. Do you have a concept about that, or do you have ideas <laughs> how we could do that, or short of that, maybe Killian? I know it's a very difficult, but I'm, I'm trying to reach how can we better risk stratify these heterogeneous cohorts and deliver them the therapy they need in a BCG unresponsive. I, w I would say that for for it's it's probably a question that no one can really answer for for it, uh, especially uh, in these early settings where we we years after years see more heterogeneous uh, population, uh, including patients but also tumors who are uh, really different. And as the different studies who have shown different um, answers, especially in terms of biomarkers, we have seen that there are. Um, uh, debate in terms of PDL, the use of PDL1, CT8, TMB as biomarkers. For now, we do not have the, the perfect one, and I don't know that we, if we will have it today. And probably score, including different uh, um, uh, biomarkers and, and pathological settings, could could be better for for choosing these patients. Maybe. Uh, I think I think Kilian. Can I ask you two questions, uh, Kilian, that, are, that, that for me have been, have been points of views that uh, actually medical oncologists have been asking me these questions and I'm happy I can ask you that and I never had a good answer. And, and that is, if you look at the pembrolizumab in a BCG unresponsive, and, and, and Benjamin has said, look, uh, you have a response rate is around the 40% and you know, at one year, 20%. They say it's just not enough for me to take that risk. And, and Benjamin has said, look, your risk of losing a patient is minimal. Those three patients that had higher stage, they had their, actually, the cystectomy at 100 and 300 days after. So I think it's delay in, in radical therapy. It's not uh, missing the window of opportunity. But what would you say would be the, hell, uh, you know, the benchmark you would say, it's, I would feel comfortable for this therapy in, in the BCG on response, you know, or the very high risk non-muscle invasive. Do you have a feeling? I mean, I know everybody's grappling. This is the, the question. Is one in five sufficient for you? Mm. Um, I think it has several aspects. The question is, is it a treatment that basically safely delays radical cystectomy? Is it a treatment that we actually think that protects the patient from any radical cystectomy? And also there, I think we really have to think about we're giving them systemic treatment, like you mentioned before, for a localized disease. So if really, I think, we take a treatment that has systemic side effects compared to localized options that we have nowadays, which didn't, were not head-to-head -head comparisons till now, for sure. But I think for now, I don't even see the big signal for a systemic therapy that prevents metastasis, that prevents radical cystectomies, and we have to be aware that those are all patients who were either ineligible for a cystectomy or did not want to undergo mm -hmm. cystectomy. So I think this is also something to keep in mind if you would actually give a patient that is fit for a radical cystectomy, if that is really an option for him to take the risk of side effects, 
to take the risk of tumor progression. I think we're definitely not there yet, and uh, we have to find patient populations that are really well defined for it. I think patient who is not able to undergo cystectomy, this is definitely an option. That is a no-brainer yeah, in this setting. But for all those patients who actually have a curative option up front, I think you should take every opportunity to heal that patient. Specifically with the same type of um, side effect profile to that, probably a local therapy, and, and we've talked about the, the role of radiation and other local therapies that could be used in combination. Uh, 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 last question I had for you, Kilian. Um, Benjamin has talked about how in a neoadjuvant and adjuvant setting, you're gonna use your drugs early, maybe not to the full extent we feel they could get the benefit, two cycles, three cycles in the knee adjuvant, and now checkmate 274 in the adjuvant setting one year, survival benefit, or DFS benefit, sorry. So how does that, you think, gonna change uh, your management in a metastatic setting? Is it gonna be like cisplatin, you say it responds one year, you're fine, you can re-challenge it. Do we have any message, or, or you think switching drugs may be an option? I know this is a black box, but you have a lot of clinical experience. Could you give me a sense of that? I mean, at the moment, um, I think the biggest challenge for us at the moment are those patients who have been treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy at the moment, who still have high risk features to progress after radical cystectomy. Those patients are probably the ones who benefit from an adjuvant checkpoint inhibition, though those trials are actually not that clear that actually those patients are the ones who respond. These might actually be the patients who do not respond to a checkpoint inhibitor as well. When we think about getting a checkpoint inhibitor in the neoadjuvant setting, I think then basically at time of progression, clearly it will be platinum-based therapy. Mm -hmm. I think from different tumor entities, also from U3 cancer, we do not have any data that supports a recharge of a checkpoint inhibitor that does not really support the switch between a PD-1 and PDL-1 inhibitor. I mean, these are single patient experience where we do report those, but I think definitely therefore Platinum-based chemotherapy will be still a backbone of treatment, mm. either in the knee adjuvant or the metastatic setting. And it will be probably more um, an, an algorithm where we have to choose between the frontline therapies. If a patient has received an upfront checkpoint inhibitor, he probably will get a platinum-based chemotherapy afterwards if he's fit for it. Patients who have been treated with knee adjuvant chemotherapy still, maybe there's a subgroup that does benefit from chemotherapy, those patients will be the ones who will be probably treated uh, with a checkpoint inhibitor. And that is, I think, something that we saw from sequencing therapy also in prostate cancer, where we do have this system to basically um, switch between targeting AR and giving a chemotherapy where we not would switch between two AR targeting agents. Mm. So therefore, I think we really have to develop that, but this will need real world data because no, no randomized prospective clinical trial will ever answer that question. And I guess in that setting as well, a great point, I mean, is, is also looking at the CTL4 different than PD-1 or PDL one and, and we see it in kidney cancer. So they, they probably, we cannot just call it immunotherapy. We need to find out which one, because that, that may work in a, as a combination therapy or as a sequence therapy. So let me ask you a last question, and then we're gonna go to the break because it's a great question uh, from Stefan Madersbacher that uh, every patient, every one of us um, gets sort of from time to time. Now with the uh, neoadjuvant cisplatin-based combination chemotherapy in a neoadjuvant setting, we had a good response rate around the 30%. Patients often ask us, do we need a, a radical cystectomy afterwards? Now with the checkpoint inhibitor, we might even, or in combination in the future, we may push it even by 40, 50%. Do we still need a radical cystectomy? Or can we uh, consolidate with radiation or even identify some patients that may not need anything at all? Can you give us a sense on that, your, your thoughts to this? And Benjamin, maybe a, a one or two words on that too, and then we will. I mean, my, my thoughts are immune checkpoint interviews might actually have the potential to change our paradigm there. I think we do have single patient experiences. Clinical trials are ongoing if it's actually safe, either just to go with a systemic checkpoint immunization or to combine it with radiation therapy. Uh, but we haven't really clear answers there yet. 
But since we do see that we do have really long-term responders on immune checkpoint inhibitors, I think this is the first treatment, the first systemic treatment, where we actually could even consider such an approach, mm -hmm. a monitoring patient afterwards. But I think we are definitely not there yet, and we do not have any results that support to spare patients from a radical cystectomy at this time. Yeah, if you look at the cisplatin data, you have approximately uh, you know 30% of those that we think are clinical T0 after neoadjuvant cisplatin uh, that eventually will have so one third will have tumor that is unrecognized neither by MRI or so on that could be significant. So Benjamin, do you think now just a question? Uh, you can say yes or no, and or I don't know. Do you think the future might hold neoadjuvant cisplatin like the abalumab? You know, you could get your four cycles and then get a maintenance checkpoint inhibitor in those that have a response. And that might be the treatment of muscle invasive bladder cancer or some muscle invasive bladder cancers. I would say probably in a very few uh, portion of patients, we can probably continue to have observation and, and CPI for long term. So, will be, so we will have to, to, of course, select this patient take into account also the cost of this kind of treatments, mm -hmm. uh, which will be probably one of the main issue in the, in the future for, for the CPI, but probably we are still not uh, ready for, for this kind of, of preservation treatment. Thank you very much for this wonderful area. You see, I'm personally very excited about this, this area because uh, a lot of innovation is happening. Thank you very much to the two speakers, to all the speakers of that session. We're gonna take approximately a 10 minutes break. I know we are behind deadline, but this is often a sign of a good meeting. That means a lot of discussion is happening. So let's uh, start in 10 minutes. That is uh, 1700 uh, with our last session. That is, we call it general urology, but it should be actually called urology and beyond. And, and I promise you, you're, uh, you're gonna have a wonderful uh, three more talks, and one of them will be just on a topic that is hot. That is what we're gonna do with COVID patients that are in a hospital, symptomatic, what can we do to alleviate the symptoms and get them better? That's gonna be the last talk. Thank you very much.
It's now my great pleasure to introduce as a next speaker, uh, Professor Richard Krevenner. Uh, Richard has been a long co-worker um, and he is the chair in, of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. And his talk is on cancer rehabilitation. I think it's a very in important topic, not only surgery, not only medical treatment, but also cancer rehabilitation should be part of our treatment strategies. Richard, please. Thanks for invitation to the organizers. My name is Richard Krevena and I will talk about cancer rehabilitation in the next few minutes. I'm from the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and Occupational Medicine. And in our portfolio, rehabilitation is a very big part and especially cancer rehabilitation. Cancer patients are suffering from side effects of necessary uh, cancer treatment. Some of them are fatigue, loss of muscle mass and of muscular strength and endurance capacity, decreased flexibility and decreased mobility, disturb sensory motor function, polyneuropathy, impaired mental health due to dysthymia, depression, anxiety, distress, sexual dysfunction, incontinence, an impaired quality of life and impaired social uh, participation in impaired participation at workplace and impaired return to work. But how to manage such short-term and long-term side effects with cancer rehabilitation? Cancer rehabilitation is a tool uh, which can occur as an inpatient rehabilitation, as an outpatient rehabilitation, and since 2018 also as tele-rehabilitation. It has uh, several modules such as information education, psycho-oncology, nutrition, and the big part of physical medicine and rehabilitation, and there especially activity, physical activity and exercise. The goals of cancer rehabilitation are to improve and increase survival, to improve participation and quality of life, and to increase self confidence. Austrian examples for cancer rehabilitation are at the General Hospital of Vienna at the Medical University. We started in 1999 with the first outpatient clinic for cancer rehabilitation and with the first group exercising during adjuvant chemotherapy against breast cancer on the day of chemotherapy, before the application of chemotherapy, we were the world at first who exercised actively with patients suffering from metastatic bone disease, but also with patients suffering uh, from metastatic brain disease. Until this time, exercise was contraindicated for such patients. About 20 to 25 years ago, exercise has been seen as a contraindication for almost all cancer patients, but in this time, there occurred a change in paradigm. Today, regular physical activity and exercise seems to be essential for most cancer patients. We were also the world at first who made a kind of exercise, a passive exercise, by using neuromuscular electrical stimulation in patients suffering from also metastatic bone and brain disease, but also all cancer patients, but only in places where no tumor mass is located, not at the tumor site. From 2010 to yet, uh, we have a comprehensive cancer center Vienna tumor board for cancer rehabilitation. At the beginning, it was the first worldwide and unique. Today, there have been implemented other tumor boards in East of Asia. And since 2015, we have a CCC platform for side effects management, supportive care and rehabilitation, also from the Comprehensive Cancer Center. And now, a kind of modern rehabilitation is the prehabilitation. Uh, uh, cancer rehabilitation uh, is after cancer treatment. Cancer prehabilitation is before cancer uh, treatment. It uses the pre-treatment time period 
to prevent a treatment-related functional decline and its subsequent consequences and therefore occurs between the time of cancer diagnosis and the beginning of acute cancer treatment. Cancer rehabilitation seems to be able to improve functional status and physical and psychological health outcomes and decrease overall health care costs. And in most or in all rehabilitation concepts, exercise is the main part. There are existing multimodal rehabilitation concepts, also including uh, psychological, mental approaches, and so on, and nutrition, but also uh, uh, unimodal rehabilitation concepts, including only the exercise part. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Exercise seems to be a kind of poly pill today, a pill which helps against several uh, health uh, issues. Exercise helps in the prevention, in the treatment and therapy, and prehabilitation, as mentioned just before, and rehabilitation of cancer patients. And it's, uh, exercise uh, influences not only the quality of life, which would be enough, an improved quality of life, but it influences also the chronic inflammation and the uh, disturbed metabolism and also the survival of cancer patients. Exercise has positive effects, benefits for the physical performance capacity. It helps against distress and against anxiety. It improves the night sleep and reduces the symptom of fatigue. It increases libido and increases therefore quality of life and participation, but also it has its effect on inflammation and metabolism and overall survival, especially cardiovascular survival, but also cancer-specific survival in several cancer entities. There are existing uh, guidelines for cancer survivors, exercise guidelines. The last consensus statement uh, was uh, published last November, November 2019. And it was also stated that exercise today is medicine and oncology, but also that the exercise for cancer patients has to have a medical prescription and a supervision by physicians. Almost everybody is able to perform regular exercise, even patients with metastatic bone disease or multiple myeloma, but also patients with severe cardiovascular disease. The know-how, the know-how to do the exercise is very important, and this know-how lies uh, in the physician's uh, uh, decision. But before starting exercise, you have to reduce pain in the patient, because a patient who has pain will not perform regularly exercise during the whole year, during the whole survival. Therefore, before the beginning of exercise, there has to occur a symptom reduction, pain reduction, to increase flexibility and mobility, to make able the patient to walk, to run, and to perform regular systematic exercise, such as training in German. You can use to reduce the pain physical modalities, but also infiltrations, medications, and so on, so-called painkillers, to reduce before the symptom pain, and then to do a receipt for exercise, and the patient can start with the exercise. For uh, 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 plantar heel or plantar fasciitis, where the patient will not walk or run, you have to perform, to perform for example, a shockwave treatment, a focused extracorporeal shockwave treatment, which is very effective and also time efficient, or also against the uh, uh, symptom polyneuropathy. You can use shockwave treatment. In this case, it's an expert uh, uh, indication, and we're performing at the moment a study to study this. Then you can start with the exercise to increase the endurance capacity and or to increase muscular strength and to increase muscle mass, but also exercises to improve uh, flexibility and sensory motor functions. Biofeedback as a form of applied neuropsychophysiology can help the patient to get self-competence. It can be used for stress management, 
in many pain syndromes for ergonomics, but especially in cases with problems of the pelvic floor, such as incontinence or pelvic pain. In the middle of this slide, you can see a vaginal probe and a rectal probe used for pelvic floor exercises, uh, which are biofeedback assisted. Incontinence, pelvic pain, and more. You can see the pelvic floor exercises, the Kegel exercises, the biofeedback, but also different uh, uh, whole body vibrations, uh, exercises such as vibration beds and so on. These all can increase the health of the pelvic floor after surgery, for example. It is important to know once more, almost everybody is able to perform regular exercise. Even patients with critical or complex health issues. Most physical concepts for rehabilitation, but also for prehabilitation or during treatment, are multimodal concepts. Multimodal concepts for physical activity, you see the uh, shock wave treatment of the plantar heel, and after this, different from, from exercises, or for the symptoms of incontinence, but also in sexual medicine and in pelvic pain. In the middle, you see, for example, uh, treatment beds with whole body vibration, but also where the pelvic flow exercises can be performed on them. But in the center, you see also the guidelines for exercise. And multiportal concepts are even used in pain syndromes such as musculoskeletal syndromes. At the end of this short presentation, I will give you my take home messages. Exercise seems to be a polypeel in the prevention, in the therapy, in the treatment, and in the rehabilitation, but also in the prehabilitation of cancer patients. And cancer rehabilitation, including exercise, can improve survival can, in some cancer entities, increase survival, can improve participation, such as social participation, and return to work, improves quality of life, self-confidence, and is an integral part of cancer care. Once more, I want to thank for invitation. Please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much, Richard, for this highly interesting and also very important talk. I think you have raised uh, a very uh, uh, true point, and this is we need. We are, this is also the responsibility of the treating physician to enable the patient to lead a normal life besides cancer. It's about the life besides cancer. This is also our responsibility. And on the other hand, um, we shouldn't forget about the important ways in uh, how exercise can modulate the immune system. And this is uh, more relevant today, maybe uh, in the era of immune checkpoint inhibitors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're going to go to the next topic. Um, um, we actually had planned a whole topic, a whole area on urology beyond cancer. Uh, I would almost call it, this is the area that falls short, but uh, this is how our department and our institution with the Comprehensive Cancer Center is evolving over the years. We are highly focused on oncology. But there are certainly, uh, uh, as a urologist, uh, a high uh, predominance of other diseases that are of uh, high importance, as we had the talk on BPH, but I think also uh, on incontinence, reconstruction, andrology, infertility, and so on. Um, that are of major importance. One area that is, uh, I would say, the bread and butter of every urology, uh, urologist is stone management. Kidney stones is a highly prevalent disease. Early in life leads not only to uh, individual uh, um, pain and uh, individuals having a lot of uh, discomfort and, and problems with it, but also as a societal level and a public health point of view, it's very cost intensive. Uh, days lost from work and so on that are of major importance. 
Um, we're going to have as next speaker uh, our, uh, one of our vice chairs at the Department of Urology that focuses a lot on uh, stone management and stone care. It's part of the uh, European lito lithiasis uh, group as well as of the guidelines and also in the, US, in the German guidelines and worldwide expert in stone management, uh, Christian Seitz, who's going to talk about active stone treatment and patient's quality of life. Enjoy that lecture. Dear Chairman, dear colleagues and friends, I talk about stone management and patients' quality of life. The quality of life is a term for the quality of various domains in life. It is a subjective, multidimensional concept that defines a standard level for emotional, physical, material, and social well being. And it serves as a reference against which an individual can measure its own life. On this world map, you see the degree of happiness. And the darker the color, the more happy the people are in the country. And you can see that Austria is one of the most happiest places in the world. Happiness represents the ultimate outcome of a high quality of life. And several aspects have to be included. It uses the real gross domestic product per capita, having someone to count on, so relationships in life, perceived freedom to make your own choices, freedom from corruption, and last not least, a healthy life expectancy. And the worldwide high prevalence of stone disease is a serious health problem, which has a significant effect on patients' quality of life. And within the healthcare system, patients with urinary stones represent an ideal group for the investigation of health-related quality of life. And why is that? Because stone disease has a high prevalence, it has a peak incidence in the socially active generation with severe symptoms and a high recurrence rate. And the recent interest in the health-related quality of life of patients with stones coincides with healthcare reforms placing emphasis on patient-reported outcomes and on endpoints focusing on well-being and satisfaction. The most common generic instrument used for health-related quality of life measures is in the short form 36. The short form 36 consists of two dimensions, mental health, and physical health. And eight scale scores, namely physical functioning, role physical, bodily pain, general health perceptions, vitality, social role functioning, role emotional, and mental health, which are weighted sums of the questions in the sections, which consist of, for example, can you lift grocery stores? How far can you walk? Do you have pain? How is your energy level? Do you feel worn out? Are you nervous? Are you happy? So many questions which affect a patient's life and quality of life are asked here. Limitations for the short form are, for example, that sleep variables are not considered and that there is a low response rate in the elderly population. Since generic instruments as the short form 36 lack crucial content validity, the first stone disease specific instrument, the Wisconsin Quality of Life Questionnaire, has been developed, designed to understand the quality of life of patients with a history of kidney stones. It features 28 questions assessed through a five point Likert scale grouped into seven domains. It deals, for example, with energy levels, sleeping disturbances, physical pain, social interest, and worries about the present situation. It has been recently released and validated in different languages. Studies are increasingly considering the quality of life depending 
on the treatment modality used. The impact of drainage type after percutaneous nephrotopy on the health-related quality of life has, for example, been rarely studied. Zhang et al. conducted a prospective randomized trial to evaluate the differences in health-related quality of life among patients who received different drainage types, namely nephrostomies or ureteral stents. And they found that patients with nephrostomy tube drainage had significantly longer length of stay and required more analgesia prior to tube removal than patients with ureteral stent placement. So the conclusion is that ureteral stents are favorable. However, when looking at health-related quality of life parameters using the Wisconsin Quality of Life Questionnaire, patients with ureteral stents reported higher rates of stent irritation related symptoms and higher rates of entity, annoyance and irritability. So they rated nephrostomy tubes as being better. So participants responded negatively about stent related symptoms but also had detrimental effects of increased fatigue, loss of sleep, sleep quality, less motivation for work and daily activities, need to change daily schedules and travel arrangements, and seemingly more frustrated, worried, and annoyed. Similarly, a randomized controlled comparison of an amphrostomy drainage versus ureteral stent following percutaneous nephrotomy found that the Wisconsin quality of life questionnaire is significantly worse in the ureteral stent group versus the nephrostomy group at one week but not at four weeks. The selection of therapeutic modalities should be based not only on response rates, but also on effects on the psychological, functional, social, and economic life over time. The following study was a comparative cross-sectional study with 275 enrolled patients undergoing nephrolithotomy, ureteroscopy, or shockwave lithotripsy, and a comparator group consisting of an equal number of healthy volunteers selected from the general population. So the aim of the study was first to find out whether stone-treated patients compared favorably with a healthy volunteer group in terms of quality of life, and second, which treatment modality was rated favorable by the patients. The health-related quality of life was assessed in the two study groups using the short form 36 questionnaire. Results demonstrated that post lithotripsy patients had a favorable health-related quality of life compared with healthy volunteers. Such results indicate the positive effect of lithotripsy on quality of life of patients with this non-life-threatening disease. These patients seem to have a better appreciation of the health, both physically and emotionally, after recovery from urinary stones than before, when their ability to perform work or activities had been impaired due to physical or emotional problems. When looking at patient ratings of one of the three types of lithotripsy, namely percutaneous nephrolithotomy, ureteroscopy, or extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, those who underwent percutaneous lithotripsy had significantly the worst mean scores, whereas those treated by shockwave lithotripsy had the highest scores and rated shockwave lithotripsy as more favorable compared to the other treatment modalities. The next study compared ureteroscopy versus shockwave lithotripsy. And they assessed the patients at four time points, before surgery, at the day of discharge, one and six months after lithotripsy. Shockwave lithotripsy was favorable compared to ureteroscopy and achieved significantly higher mean scores on five different subscales of the short form 36. Results of the study demonstrated that the quality of life was superior for shockwave lithotripsy compared to ureteroscopy at discharge. And the longer hospital stay and higher postoperative pain were determinants of the lower quality of life in the ureteroscopy group. 
of interest, despite the lower stone flow rate of shockwave letter trip C, which was 72% versus 93% in the ureteroscopy group, there were no significant differences in quality of life scores between the groups at the one and six month time points. Those results are of interest, as there is a clear tendency away from shockwave litotrip C towards ureteroscopic stone treatment. And we have to ask ourselves if this development is patient driven. Because according to patient reported quality of life, shockwave litotrip C should be the first choice of treatment. A systematic review investigated how urinary calculi influence the health-related quality of life and the tr patient treatment preference. And in this study, patient ranked treatment options from most to least desirable, and the order was in favor for shockwave litotripsy, followed by ureteroscopy and percutaneous nephrolithotomy. And although most patients prefer the treatment pathway to be decided by the treating physician regarding quality of life, Again, shockwave litotripsy was favored about other interventions. A prospective randomized study looked at the effect of shockwave litotripsy and retrograde interrenal surgery on health related quality of life in 10 to 20 millimeter renal stones. In this study, the short form 36 survey was used to determine the health related quality of life preoperatively, postoperatively and after one month. According to guidelines, the shockwave litotripsy and retrograde interrenal surgery in 10 to 20 millimeter renal stones have similar outcomes, but the guidelines do not take the quality of life after those treatments into consideration. Similar to the studies before, presented before, patients in the shockwave litotripsy group again showed more favorable health-related quality of life scores. So when deciding for the treatment modality besides the clinical outcomes or probable complications, patient reported outcomes must be considered. Results indicate the positive effect of active stone treatment on quality of life of patients. Patients seem to appreciate the health both physically and emotionally. I conclude that physician-centric outcomes such as stone status, are no longer the only objective and acceptable measures. Soon, treatment decisions need to consider several aspects, not only rendering the patient stone free or having complications, but also possible effects of different therapeutic alternatives on health-related quality of life. With this reframing in mind, a fundamental change is taking place, one in which we prioritize measuring health-related quality of life. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Christian, for this very nice talk about stones. Well, I'm just a pathologist, so I do not handle very much stones. But nevertheless, there's one thing I really would like to put into the head of urologists. If you have a patient and you know he has stone disease, please tell your pathologist when you make a urine cytology. Because if you do not mark it, we have very heavy changes. And it might be that we think it's a tumor and you will take out the kidney and there will just be a stone. So please really tell us that the patient has a stone. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, this uh, management of stones and, and in a daily practice is not as simple as it seems as you have a complexity of tools, complexity of, of uh, uh, strategies you can use. And it certainly should be similar to oncological care, delivered in a shared decision making with the patient to reach the optimum in quality of life as a primary endpoint in that disease. Um, it is for me a tremendous honor, I have to say, and, and really with pride, I told you at the beginning of the whole session at one o'clock, that uh, uh, this year has been a milestone year for me. And uh, the reason in this moment with the next talk, this is coming to fruition. And the reason being, um, Manuel Schmidinger, who you've seen, you know very well, has joined the Department of Urology, and she's been, uh, I think, one of the persons I most uh, admire and in, in have met over the last 20 years. And then another tremendous step was uh, Eva Compera 
has uh, taken a, a professorship at the university and joined the Europathology, who has uh, you know, lifted us to new dimensions of care we can do and research we can do. And she's also one of the most amazing persons I've met. And uh, it comes to fruition that uh, good things happen in triplicate. And then uh, um, um, a few months ago, we, uh, we had a long discussion with a, a person that became a friend of mine over the years that I, um, I, I have to say not only I admire, but uh, I, I look up to in many cases, not only for his hard work, his dedication to his field, but because of his knowledge and in his in-depth uh, uh, attention to the individual patient and uh, to his partners that he is supporting as a, a, from a specialty that is a supportive specialty, I would say, to other specialties. Florian Thalhammer, that everybody knows uh, in Austria, has joined the Department of Urology, which is a game changer for us, as uh, uroinfectiology is a big area of urologic care. And he was supposed to give a lecture on urinary tract infection, where uh, you know this is a real uh, public health problem. Uh, bigger than the pandemic, the number of people dying from infections, the urinary tract infection, unnecessary, and others, is uh, uh, millions around the world and other issues that we have. And uh, he was supposed to talk about this subject also, uh, but uh, last minute, so approximately two hours ago, three hours ago, I called him and said, uh, look, uh, Florian, I would like you, if you could, to talk about corona. And the reason and COVID-19 and in an area of COVID-19 where there's not a lot of expertise or I would say not a lot of talks about. Uh, Florian needs no introduction. Uh, in Austria, there is no single doctor who doesn't know Florian. And also in the public, he's a very no, uh, well-known person. He is the foremost expert in infections in Austria. He's uh, the president of the Infection Society in Austria. He's the education uh, chair of the uh, um, uh, internal medicine society for many years in a row. Uh, he's not only been somebody who has dedicated his life in patient care, but also to education. He's on multiple consensus statements. He has the handbook that every uh, doctor uses here to uh, see which antibiotics in which situation and what is the resistance uh, pattern and so on in the regions and how to think. And he's the only person I know who willingly has two pagers, not only one pager, so that people can uh, call him and he's working really around the clock. And with the corona uh, crisis, he's not only the government advisor, hospital advisor, city of Vienna advisor, he's been the person that has probably got most calls and solved most problem to the satisfaction, not only to the, uh, of the patient, but to the system because it's a very practical and, and medicine and a real world view of, of diseases and their management needs. Um, I, uh, with the, uh, deep gratitude, I thank you, Florian, for uh, taking two hours before the whole thing and saying, I'm gonna change all my slides. I gotta do, talk about something totally different, but uh, I knew you could pull it off because uh, something this is unique to you. Uh, and uh, he's gonna talk about an area that is not that much talked about in, in, in the corona phase, but uh, what happens to the symptomatic patient and his, uh, to alleviate his symptoms. We're not talking about vaccines. And you have heard a lot about it, a lot of evolving things. And we're not talking about too much about detection, antigen tests and so on, where he's also a foremost expert, but is about the management of the symptoms and so on in the hospital. Thank you very much, Florent, for being with us and having the keynote lecture of today's. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you very much, Sharok, for the warm welcome from you and your staff in my new department. First of all, you see here my disclosure, and I want to start with some experience with the clinics uh, of the disease. You know, if you have a patient, you have to look if he has fever, if he has any kind of sore throat or cough, if he has, he has dyspnea or the atralgia, but also don't forget the smelling and tasting is very important. If you lost it, you know the patient has corona and you don't need any test anymore. We also know that most of the patients will be healthy without our doing. 80% can stay at home, but a very small part of these patients need our hospital and a very small part need our, as our intensive care units. And this small part, 50%, will die. If you look, when we have to start therapy and when we have to start which therapy, we have to change the 
the disease in two parts. The first part is a clinical virologic infection. You need a treatment which is working against the virus. The second part is an immunologic phenomenon, and you need other kinds of treatment, and we will see it in the treatment options we will have. What can we do? We can block um, the connection of the virus with the AC2. We can block the activation of the spike protein. We can um, kill the virus cell. And, and the last point is we can eliminate the pro-inflammatory cytokines. Here you see a lot of treatment options. The, dear, uh, the slide is old one because some of the treatments never would stand here any longer. But you see the several points of treatment options. You see very old uh, virus, uh, uh, virus statica and very old new one, and I will discuss it with you. The second option is the cytokine storm to treat this one. I think this is very impressive because we know from oncologic patients and also first of rheumatologic patients that these patients who have treatments with biologics will not get ill with corona, or if they get ill, they will not be, become very ill. And you see a lot of monoclonal antibodies, you know it from different kinds of medicine, which is here working. I will start now with the classical virostatic treatment. This is in the moment my favorite. I will explain it. Favipiravir, we have it in the General Hospital of Vienna, is an old drug of Japan, of Japan which is allowed to give in patients a second line for influenza treatment. But I say it is the amoxicillin glavulinic acid of in German augmentin in the field of virus infection, when you can give it for FSMA, you can give it to measles, you can give, give it for Westphal fever, and you give it, can give it also for influenza. And now this is tested in SARS-CoV-2 infections. The first test was not very fine, but now we have more uh, studies and they show that patients who get favipiravir have an advantage to, to these patients who get Calatra or nothing. Here see you the, the study with favipiravir against lopinavir and ritonavir. Here you see also that it's a de dose-dependent treatment that says we need high dosage. And this high dosage is really high dosage because the dosage for the influenza treatment is much lower. We you see here only two times daily, 800 milligrams. But in the treatment for COVID, we need very uh, stronger treatment. And you see, we have a Japanese schedule or we have a Russian schedule. We can say the Japanese is the better one because more studies, but uh, in Austria, I think when I look around here, the Russian is better because we have not small people and we have heavy people that have need uh, more dosage. Another one treatment option is Leronlimab. Leronlimab is um, a new drug in HIV and it is a, also a monoclonal uh, antibody against CCR5 on the CD4 lymphocytes and is working that it inhibits the entry of the virus in the cell. It is allowed to give in USA, this is an emergency indication become, but I know no further studies how it is work. I know only the two phase two studies. Everybody knows remdesivir. Some of you may be bought um, act, um, sure. shares. And you lost a lot of money because it, don't, it doesn't work. We have the first um, treatments in cell culture. It was very fine. You can see the cells are killed. Then we have two studies, the adaptive COVID trial and the simple study. And both studies uh, allowed then the USA FDA to an emergency indication. In the beginning, we, give, we gave remdesivir 10 days. You know, remdesivir has to be given intravenously with a loading dose on day, eight, day one, and then five or 10 days for the maintenance treatment. Uh, the hype was very fine. And we saw it, it is working, but then it came the worse. 
we know that the patient had nephrologic problems, we have a hepatotoxicity, and this shows that we have no um, significant reduction of mortality, uh, but we have a lot of side effects. So the, the WHO collected all studies, you see here the table from the studies, and the conclusion was that remdesivir is not the, the treatment of choice. And the WHO also said uh, that remdesivir has possibly no effect on mortality and possibly no effect on other important outcomes, and it's no longer um, to give to the patients. Interestingly is that the both uh, FDA and EMA say still, uh, still it is a good drug and the patient can be treated. To my person, I want to get in the moment, in the moment, uh, favipiravir. And it looks like that the company sees the problem because now you have combination treatments and here you see baricitinib with remdesivir. I will uh, speak uh, later on baricitinib uh, because it is an immunomodulating drug and I have only, uh, also a chapter to immunomodulating drugs. We have some other uh, virus uh, drugs and this, these are old one and you find it only in the East, Russian, Ukraine, China, uh, Japan. Tilerone and Umifenovir both are over-the-counter drugs. You can buy it in the Ukraine or in Russia. Both are, have a very broad spectrum against some uh, viruses. You see also influenza, uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, Huntan, hepat, uh, hepes um, simplex, polio, SARS, and we have no uh, uh, development of resistance. Also, it's, it is working against chikokunia and MERS, and therefore the trials are going on for both drugs, but it is the, the, study, uh, is the studies uh, who are going on are not so fine as the studies for uh, favipiravir. Immunomodulatory treatment. Here, of the first one is Andakinra. It is one of the first uh, monoclonal drugs we have in the rheumatologic diseases. And you see this the first study say that you have a good um, activity against remdesivir and it could be that in some weeks anakinra is one of the compounds which is the treatment uh, of choice. Asunacept is on, um, in the moment ongoing also in our hospital as an adjunctive treatment and there in the moment uh, those finding studies, you see it 25, 100 milligram or 400 milligram uh, against uh, COVID-19. Bamlandivimab, also a new drug who has an emergency indication got by the FDA. Uh, it is working as the S protein of SARS-CoV-2. It is a, a single shot treatment with 700 milligram. Uh, and the, interestingly is, is we have to start our treatment, to my opinion, and this is the first drug for this one, we have to start our treatment be before the patient is coming to the hospital. That means as influenza, if you give um, oseltamivir, the best thing is the patient take it at home because you have to treat the patient in the first 24 or 28, hour, uh, 24 or 48 hours. That is not possible if the patient is coming to the hospital because they have lost two to three days. Here's the same. The contraindication is therefore hospital uh, and that the patient needs uh, oxygen. That means maybe this drug will give the patient if it is tested positive and then we can prohibit the development of the disease. Baricitinib is a uh, no, drug uh, inhibitor well known in rheumatology and also in oncology. And we have the first experience some um, months ago, but it's what not used. And now you have the first studies and you see this, uh, that baricitinib is working well and it is uh, becoming 
also a standard treatment in future, I think, uh, for SARS-CoV-2. Another immunomodulatory treatment is Casirivimab and Imetivimab. You have to give them both. It's a combination treatment. It's also working at the S protein from the, from the COVID-19. It should be given also before the patient uh, is coming to the hospital and before the patient needs oxygen. And uh, it, it is planned to give the patient with a high risk to develop then severe COVID. Maybe patients with adipositas, maybe patients with comorbidity, not for very young patients because there the infection is normally gone uh, as a normal coronavirus. Here you see that the treatment is also tested on, not only for treatment, if the patient is positive, also for prophylaxis. And you can see the data in, of the mouse model that is working very well. Interferon beta is also one of the interferons who is given uh, in this indication, but interferon is then given in, um, by inhalation in patients who is very ill and in the, in the ICU. The standard treatment at the moment is corticosteroids. Everybody knows dexamethasone, six milligram, but you can give every corticosteroid. It is cl clear that you give it the patients who are sick in the hospital, but there is no um, evidence that you can give it for patients who are in the outpatient department. This is an individual um, discussion. You see here, and I think it, is, it will go in this direction, methylprednisolone only three days with, uh, with one milligram per kilogram body weight. And I think this is a small dosage of corticosteroid which you can give patients also at home. Then we know plasma. We know plasma from other diseases, through um, FSMA, for example, before we had any treatment. And it was a hype, and the hype is gone. Because the study in the New England shows clearly that uh, this treatment has no benefit for the patient. It's only expensive. And I think the only patients who profit from this uh, plasma therapy will be patients who have a um, deficiency of immune globulins. And if you give them immune globulins, then you can give plasma from patients who had coronavirus. Docalizumab is the last one of the immunomodular therapy which I will show you. You know it is an inhibitor of interleukin-6. And he, this is the treatment if the patient is ill and has a cytokine storm. That means we have in the moment the standard treatment of dexamethasone plus a kind of virostatic treatment. I would prefer favipiravir in the moment, but the new uh, drugs are coming in six to 12 years, uh, six to 12 months. And if the patient needs an immunomodulatory treatment, uh, a check inhibitor or tocilizumab, maybe high dose under Kindra. Which treatments we have in addition? You know all the recombinant human SS2 inhibitor, APNOB1, uh, who is blocking the spike protein. Um, there was also many study, uh, there are also many papers in newsletters, newspapers, but moment, in the moment I don't know if it is working well, which is very silent about this new drug. But you know this drug, a very old one, acetylsalicylsäure, aspirin. There is a new study from the US, 80 milligram. This is the normal standard dose. In Austria, it would be thromboas with 100 milligram. And you need, you know, at, as, um, aspirin is also good against gram-negative infections. And here you can give it to patients who are ill with COVID-19. Aviptatil is a human vasoactive intestinal peptide. It is treatment for pulmonary um, hypertension and sarcoidosis and severe sepsis. 
and now it is tested in severe patients with um, COVID-19, that means patients who are at the intensive care. Very interesting is, you know, all Prozac. I don't know who take here Prozac, but if you take it, maybe you have a benefit because this antidepressivum uh, um, works against um, the entry of the virus in the cell and it's, uh, and it has also an, an antiviral activity. Maybe this is the future, but if you discuss it with the colleagues from the psychiatry, they told us be careful, we have side effects because there you have to take these antidepressives in very high dosage. And in NASA, to my opinion, interesting um, modality of treatment is the so-called m protease inhibitors. This is, uh, this is a key enzyme, enzyme of coronavirus replication and you can target it is. And you see you have a very wide spectrum of different kinds of drugs, antifungals, antibiotics. And there is a new study with ciprofloxacin and moxifloxacin. And maybe we take this old ciprofloxacin who has a black box warning and we can treat uh, our patients with an antibiotic. Silipenin, silipenin you know it is uh, leg alone for patients with heavy liver diseases. This is also a drug who, which was tested against hepatitis C treatment, uh, for hepatitis C treatment. And this drug has two mechanisms. The first is the reduction of the virus load. It's the first one. And the second one is, as um, propose the answer of the interferon. It, it means the cytokine storm comes later and not in this heavity. That mean, uh, there is a study ongoing in Austria. Maybe this is a very cheap treatment and maybe it is also uh, a good treatment. But very important, and this is a treatment which everybody should take who is um, SARS-CoV-2 positive, also at home, this prophylaxis and thrombosis, at, uh, against the thrombosis. Therefore, it is really essential to take um, prophylactic enoxaparin. We also can take NOAX, but there you may have interactions with other treatments option for coronavirus. Therefore, I think I would prefer uh, the prophylaxis with enoxaparin. At the ending, some fake news. I get the question if this prophylaxis is a Bulgarian prophylaxis, uh, can be recommended. You see some several medicine. Yes, the, end, the only one which is, would be working is acetylsalicyl acid, we know it aspirin, but I think the rest of them is really fake news. Then you can take echinacea. You know, this is also very nice to take it but I would not take it for SARS-CoV-2 because it will not work. Do you know this man till 20th of January? Uh, here is hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine was also a hype with chloroquine. We also bought a lot of hydroxychloroquine to a very high price. Now it is very cheap again. And also in the combination with acetromycin, it doesn't work. You can forget it. Then you can kill it healthy. Vitamin C and vitamin D. Vitamin D is everywhere working for each diseases. And vitamin C also in high doses. Uh, I know some intensive care units give it also in Austria, but there is no evidence does it work. Therefore, my uh, conclusion is we have in the moment no uh, specific therapy which is safe and which is with uh, where we have good studies that it will work. We know corticosteroids is are necessary, to my opinion, even in patients who are not at the hospital, but it is an individual decision. Every patient who is positive and any, only a little symptomatic should get a thrombosis prophylaxis. The future will be immunomodulatory treatment, at least at the patient at the hospital and the severe patients and the second 
uh, time of the disease. The most important thing, you know, is prophylaxis, exposition prophylaxis, you know this one. We can discuss it. And maybe we have a vaccination which is working next year. Thank you very much for your opinion, uh, for your listening. Thank you very much, Florian, for this wonderful lecture and this brilliant overview. Um, so talking about fake news, uh, do you know what exactly was the cocktail that Donald Trump received when he was diagnosed with COVID? No, I don't know it, but I think he got uh, some of the new monoclonal antibodies, uh, which are now coming to the market, this combination therapy, for example. But this is, was not a, a, a treatment, was a, what, what is still approved. I have a question. Um, there is very often this, um, this criticism or, or the question is raised when talking about all the elderly people uh, dying from COVID. Do they actually die because of COVID or with COVID? I think they die both with COVID and some of them um, because of their, their co comorbidity and COVID is only a comorbidity, but not uh, the infection per se. But we see that in the moment our, the, the, age, the average age is still climbing. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the statistic, patients who are dying are really old one. That means um, 90, 40 and all elder or young people our young people with comorbidity, adipositas, uh, severe diabetes, liver cirrhosis. So has the cytokine storm been connected to a specific condition uh, like, uh, let's say, age or the, the incidence of having the cytokine storm uh, being responsible for the, for the mortality? Has this been connected to uh, specific conditions, like you said, diabetes, age, etc.? No, I don't know any data. I think this is the, um, the disease going on. And if you're coming too late, you can't stop it. Mm -hmm. I see. So thank you very much. That was really brilliant. Um, and I give back to Sharok. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a wonderful presentation uh, by Florian. I, I hope I didn't promise you too much. You will see, you see he's uh, the foremost expert and he talks about an area um, that um, very little has been talked about, but is quite an important uh, area uh, in the management of uh, Corona and, and, and he's you know, the foremost expert in the country. So I wanna first of all, thank you all the listeners and participants all with your questions and with your participation and being part of our family today, uh, being part of this event. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers that have been wonderful speakers, have uh, given energy, time and content to this meeting and made it special. And before we go to the end, I want to um, also conclude here on the ceremony we do normally each year. So normally this event, uh, the Michael J. Marburger meeting we have each year is composed of a two-day visiting professor with surgical interventions, lectures, debates, and in general we have around uh, 30 to 50 international uh, uh, people joining us here. Uh, we have a few hundred listeners and we have certainly around 10 to 12 international speakers. What uh, we uh, conclude at the end after the ceremony, our events are finished, uh, we have our departmental event which ends up always in a fantastic party but it's not that only that matters but also we uh, give some awards. These awards are part of our gratitude to the members of this department who have uh, gone beyond uh, the standard who have gone the extra mile day for day to deliver the best thing they can in the promise we all made to our patients, to the society, to improve health overall and specifically in urology. So we have in general five categories we give at our university uh, of awards we give, the one that we, uh, six categories, sorry, one uh, category we will not give this year, we will give next year uh, again, it's the Lifetime Achievement Award that is generally for somebody who has made a tremendous contribution over his lifetime to the field of urology and to the University of Vienna and to the uh, to urology department. The uh, categories we will discuss today are five of the categories I will read to you 
uh, what this award is about, uh, how it's chosen, uh, and uh, our wonderful two uh, brilliant and beautiful ladies will then uh, give you the names of the winners. The first category is for clinical uh, excellence. This category is voted by all the members of the department uh, that vote the uh, biggest expert in clinical uh, excellence. The title goes like this, or the subject goes like this. It's a clinical member of staff or team who has consistently provided an exceptional level of care to patients, their family, and worked with colleagues to achieve excellence in neurologic treatment and care. So let's see who the winner is. Not really unexpected. Irene Resch. Oh. That is fantastic. Irene uh, is actually now our clinical lead in the oncology systemic therapy, if you want non-surgical, but also surgical care, in oncology uh, uh, outpatient services. Uh, she's uh, come a tremendous way from where she started. She's uh, uh, really, really an incredible doctor. And uh, she's in many ways gone beyond everything we can and beyond her own uh, challenges she had, uh, the challenges of our structures, the challenges of medicine in general, to do the best for every single patient, and uh, we thank her for that. By the way, as I told you before, this is not I who chooses this, but by all the members of the department. So I think this was pretty unanimous. I can tell you she got not 50% of the votes, but she got 90% of the votes. I've never seen this before in any votes, you know? Not even Trump has seen this probably. <laughs> so next one, excellence in education. Also a voted position. This is an award for a member or staff uh, of staff or team who has invested time and effort in developing staff through education and training to enhance or improve patient care, quality of services, or the reputation of the Department of Urology. This in general goes somebody who really is passionate about education, really cares about passing knowledge to the next generation and making things better in the next generation that comes. So, and the winner is... Not really surprising either, Harun Fakovic. And I think it's not the first time. Thank you. I have to say this is very problematic for me uh, uh, because uh, he already has won this award a multitude of times. I already told him if he's winning this year again, then he will be banned ever to participating or getting voted again because I'm not sure what he's doing, but he's bribing the people or he's really, no, I'm not, I'm joking, he's really tremendously uh, affectionate. He's not only uh, um, dedicated himself, he spends many hours uh, um, talking to people and solving problems, personal issues, educational problems, challenges that people have in achieving their milestones in uh, cognitive growth and also surgical growth. Um, but he's also at the level of the university taking the urology department beyond uh, its measures that we ever had in education. He's uh, developed a program for education uh, for the university uh, where urology is a strong member and even lead on some of the activities. Uh, and now on top of that, he's uh, um, now uh, been voted by the Austrian uh, Association for Urology as the education lead for the whole courses uh, on education. So he will uh, leave his passion out in that uh, form and that position as well. The next uh, award is Breaking Boundaries. This is an award for a pioneering clinician who provided exceptional service in a hospital and which has made significant contribution to the Department of Urology, allowing us to deliver innovation from bench to bedside. It will be given on publication, research activities, as well the translation to clinical application. Please. So who is that pioneering clinician? Dong Ho Moon.
Dong uh, is, is a resident in our department. He's not yet faculty, but um, he's been quite impressive in many ways. His organizational skills, his personality, his uh, uh, dedication, hard work has been exemplary to many of us, including myself. He's uh, delivered uh, um, through many work hours uh, a lot of uh, milestones in our departmental structure progress, administrative progress, and so on. He's led projects such as the Movember project where every single radical prostatectomy patient is captured at our institution, entered in databases and so on. He's masterminded that as well as many other activities that have been uh, quintessential as well as uh, uh, radiation programs, quality management uh, programs that we ensure that we uh, meet the criteria, quality criteria for delivering the healthcare uh, services. He has a degree in that service line and uh, he's translating that uh, degree in uh, true value. Thank you very much, Dr. Moon, for your, for your activities, your services, and everything you have done for us. Uh, no worries, this award is not uh, something you can put on your, on your list, but this means only you're gonna work double as hard next year because that's what we expect. So the next one, best researcher, research excellence. We are a university, we need to do that as, uh, as a, a key ingredient of our activities. A member of staff or team who has consistently provided an exceptional level of research and worked with colleagues to achieve excellence in urologic research and innovation. Here, the cumulative impact points of the published work within the last year will be assessed. All members are, could be voted, and our candidates here, uh, as well our fellows and all the members that we look in the lab and other activities that work in our department remotely or directly. And then? And the winner this time is Keijiro Mori. So it has been really tremendous because we have had uh, multiple fellows uh, from, uh, we have 11 fellows currently. Uh, Dr. Mori is one of our research fellows and I've uh, seen, uh, I don't think I've ever seen such a performance. Um, he is uh, writing a, a tremendous number of papers of really high quality, thoughtful uh, uh, um, papers. Uh, he's an independent investigator that has matured in the last one and a half years to a tremendous researcher, brilliance, uh, creativity, but also his style in writing and his uh, 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 products he delivers are really beyond any, uh, uh, anything I've seen. So bravo, uh, Dr. Mori. I know it's a specific challenge because English is not the natural lang language uh, barrier days. So thank you very much for this work. We will be very sad. He will leave us in a few months. We'll be very sad to see him go back to Japan, but it will be major uh, uh, progress and he will be a major player in the Japanese scene of urology and worldwide. So the next and the last award is for the best team player. It's all about working together. In a family you know you need to work together to make things happen. The sum of us all is more than each individual together. This is an award for any team member which has worked uh, together to improve with others to improve their service through either excellent patient or operational efficiency or improved quality of services. To achieve, he or she has carried out their role as a sustained level of excellence and gone the extra mile to support their colleagues to deliver change for, for the benefit of the patients and the department in general. And the best team player is Susanne Mari. Susanne has been exceptional. Uh, she, she is a doctor on award. She's a general practitioner who has been uh, really superb, has uh, uh, helped not only the doctors, but specifically a lot the nurses in uh, delivering the care they need in it every day. She never says no, she's always there for us. Uh, she had a very difficult last two years because of family conditions. And uh, despite that, she really, really, really uh, has not stopped supporting other people in the department. And uh, also every single question you have for her, she will be there to solve it for you. 
Uh, we are very grateful, Susanna. You are part of our family that we cannot uh, live without, we cannot think without. And uh, we are very grateful for everything you do every day. And, uh, and uh, what can I say? We hope you will continue to do that for the next uh, 30 years. Thank you very much. These were the awards. Uh, at the final step, let me uh, um, get uh, two wonderful bouquets here uh, for the most brilliant and most beautiful, this is a good combination, uh, to have ladies in, in the field or the family of urology. They're not urologists per se, but certainly they have contributed more to urology and the patients in urology than uh, most urologists combined. And that's for Manuela. Thank you for being the co-host today. Thank you, Thank you so Thank you. much. And, Eva Campera, who is a, a wonderful, wonderful as well to have you here, and thank you for co-hosting uh, this, uh, this uh, a little bit different type of session we had compared to the other years. I want to also hear, uh, I will have to put my mask on to be, we're getting pretty close. I want to thank uh, Divya, who has been our um, <laughs> meeting organizer. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you, the listeners and the participants. Today we had over 700 or 800 people who have joined the meeting today on YouTube and participated. I want to thank many of our live speakers and I want to also here uh, thank the team, uh, our, our technical team from the medical university as well as uh, Tobias who's been a close friend who's gone through high and lows with us. Thank you so much, Julia, as well, for your fantastic work and the, and the activities today. I will thank the team behind the desks, uh, working in the machines, the camera, and I wanna, again, wish you all, from our point of view, from our family, safe, uh, wonderful holidays. I hope you get as many gifts as you expect. You get the gifts you expect, specifically. I hope you stay safe and healthy and your family members as well. And we very much would like to see you again in a wonderful 2021 and looking forward to it. Thank you very much.